Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, Elwyn Robinson, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and author of The Rejuvenate Blueprint. And today, lovely listeners, we are bringing to you an episode about how to find a practitioner. So let's say you've used a system like Elwyn's, the Rejuvenate Blueprint. You've gone through the steps. You've identified the root cause, and now it's all about finding that person who can support you, help you, put you in the right direction to alleviate all the symptoms and get yourself back to optimal health. So tell me, Owen, how do we go about finding the right practitioner? Where do we begin? Where do we start? Take us through. Yeah, this is a great question. And if you're kind of inclined listening to this to think, oh, I don't want to learn about that or I don't need help with that, I'd say think again. Um, the amount of people who I speak to, certainly you know, clients and customers and people who email, but also a lot of people who are themselves practitioners or they're interviewing me, you know, they're, they're health experts, gurus, influencers, whatever you want to call me, uh, call them. And then when um, you talk to them about, oh, you know, maybe this could do with improving, this would be something worth looking at, this would be something worth checking into. So often people say, oh, yeah, but I talked about that with X. And yeah, often they say doctor, but not necessarily. I talked about that with my naturopath, I talked about that with, you know, my whatever. And and they don't get what you said. And they're open, they're very open to what I said, but you know, they um, basically their current practitioner is not gonna be able to help them. And as I said, the vast majority of the time, people are at least open to what I have to say, and they would like to find someone who would investigate with that with them. And just to say, like, you may not be certain that as a result of, you know, going through my videos and uh, maybe reading the book once it's out and all the rest of it, that you've definitely found the root causes to your health problem. But I think what's more likely is like, oh, this could be it. Like you've got a new possibility, right? And in some cases, you might feel like you are competent and equipped to um, work it out all for yourself. And in some cases, that is doable. Certainly, you know, as an example, if you have a deficiency in a nutrient that is safe to take, even in very high doses, um, maybe you suspect that you do, or ideally you've tested and found out that you definitely do. And, you know, sometimes that can account for a lot of symptoms that could be absolutely a root cause. And so, you know, that's something that you might just want to try adding in yourself. Maybe you listen to advice from me or someone else about what form you take and how to take it and all that kind of stuff. So maybe then you don't need a practitioner. But honestly, the majority of the time, like if we're talking about some nutritional deficiencies, if we're talking about Toxin issues, a lot of the time, I see a lot of people do detoxification supplements and practices and fast and all the rest on their own. And usually the mm, the side effect rate is pretty high and the success rate is pretty low. Obviously, with you know adjusting hormones and neurotransmitters and stuff like that, that's something that um, in many cases it's illegal to you know actually go in and directly work with exogenous hormones and stuff. Uh, even though it may be a good idea, especially as you get older, uh, without like uh, someone who is qualified to prescribe you something. And I know a lot of people just go and buy something off the internet um, and <laughs> hope that it's the right stuff and hope there's not something bad in there. And I, you know, although I've done it myself, I will freely confess I am strongly opposed to it. Um, it's it's you know very risky. And not a good idea. I realize if you feel like you have no alternatives, it seems like a good idea. But I, I'm trying to encourage, like with this episode, that there are practitioners out there who get everything that we're talking about in podcasts like this and more, and that they will be able to help you. And I want to give you guidance in this episode on how to find and identify those people. Um, and then, you know, I guess lifestyle change is something that you can do on your own in many cases. But in any case, it's still helpful to have some help. Um, chronic infections, again, I think I spent years self-medicating, trying this supplement or herb or whatever and off the internet and not really getting anywhere. And again, I strongly encourage people in many cases to at least test for themselves uh, before taking those kind of things. And I'm not even talking about antibiotics, I'm just talking about herbals, you know, like oregano oil or garlic and all these things actually have quite a strong effect and you want to make sure that you're doing them, you know, correctly and that they're actually going to help with what you have and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of emotional and psychological issues, you know, depending on how much, how, hmm, 
how traumatized you've been in your past, how much <laughs> you've healed since then, all the rest of it. It may be something you work on your own with, you know, daily meditation, daily prayer, daily affirmation, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. But it may, again, be a case where someone who can work with you, who's more of a specialist, can uh, help you get results a lot more quickly with a lot less suffering, a lot less side effects. So that's why I realized that the kind of person who's watching this podcast is probably going to be, well, based on experience, either someone who likes to do things on their own because they don't trust <laughs> experts or, uh, you know, maybe you are, a, you know, I know a lot of people watching, they are practitioners, they are, you know, doctors and nutritionists and naturopaths and this, that and the other. Um, but in either case, you know, I'd say whether you are your own expert or whether you are already an expert, you're not going to be an expert in everything. I certainly don't claim to be. And so it's really good to know for all of these potential root causes where you should go to. Um, and so that's what I want to do. But actually, before we, before I talk about the specific types of practitioners I'd recommend for each of the root causes, I thought it would be good to just talk about uh, what kind of qualities you should be looking for in a practitioner in general, because I've made a lot of mistakes in this regard over the years. And I would say, you know, a lot of my progress over the last couple of years, which we might touch on later, actually, um, has been down primarily to actually <laughs> through sheer, I don't know, trial and error and whatever, like learning how to identify a good practitioner, a practitioner that is worth putting your time, money, focus, and yes, even belief in. And rather than wasting a lot of time as I did before on people who uh, maybe seemed good in lots of different ways, but actually were not really equipped to help and in fact didn't really help. I mean, you bring up a really valid point here because as well, putting your faith or going down that route, uh, route of uh, finding somebody, depending on, and I'm really glad you brought up that you're going to go over the qualities of, you know, finding that practitioner, because there can be the thing of, I know where I've been in a desperate state of just going, oh, they say they can help me and just reaching out to them and then it going down the wrong track. And then I'm further away from my goal than I want to be. And I, oh, it's like, it's, it could be so frustrating. Absolutely. And you, say, you spend time, you spend money, you spend hope, right? I know a lot of people, hope is like a finite resource and you find a new person, you think, okay, maybe they have the answer and you put a lot of time, energy and money in. And then as you say, sometimes not only does it not help, you actually end up even worse off. And, you know, sooner or later, people do get to the point of despair and giving up. And so it matters, right? This is important. And so that's why I definitely think that uh, this is worth focusing on. Beautiful. So what are these qualities, these virtues that we should be looking for in a practitioner? So I'm not saying this is an exhaustive or complete list, and I very much encourage people, if you're on YouTube or Rumble or anywhere that you can leave comments, then leave it underneath. If you think I've missed something, you know, share it with a group. Um, but these are some of the things that I found to be most important. Uh, so the first one I would say is expertise, right? Now, this sounds like a bit of an obvious one, but notice I, I phrased it that way. I didn't say credentials. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't look for someone with credentials, but what I'm saying is the credentials are, and in fact, in some cases, as I say, if you need a prescription or something, then it has to be someone with credentials. But the main thing that I would encourage you to look for is someone with expertise. And so what I mean is, you know, we talk about thyroid a lot, for instance, on this channel, and I talk about it a lot when I go on other people's podcasts as well. And as we know, the vast majority of practitioners, both you know, GPs, general practitioners, and also even endocrinologists who are supposed to be experts in the endocrine system, of which the thyroid is one of the endocrine glands, um, they are really just not aware of most of what we're talking about on this podcast. And that's a crucial distinction. I'm not saying that everything I say is right and everything everyone else says is wrong. And I'm not saying if you meet a practitioner who has a different point of view than mine, then they must be wrong. But I am saying the issue is less that they completely understand my perspective, but they just disagree and they have a logical, rational explanation as to why, that's fair enough, right? And who knows? Maybe they're right, maybe I'm wrong. That's okay. But what I'm talking about is the people who have no concept of what I'm talking about when it comes to thyroid. So for instance, you know, um, generally, and this is, you know, I'll pick on thyroid, I'll pick on the endocrine glands for a second. Generally, uh, practitioners, and they are usually doctors who specialize in this, are only focused on the extremes. They're only interested if things are really, really, really bad already. And so 
uh, you know, in the thyroids, maybe that's one or two percent of the population. They're the only ones who they really care about and pay attention to. Obviously, if it's another gland like the pancreas, uh, that goes wrong more often. And so it's a much larger percentage of the population. But, you know, despite that huge difference between, you know, two uh, percent or 20 percent, the point is still this. Generally, a lot of doctors are only interested in once it's definitely obviously ir irrefutably already gone wrong. And so that is where their expertise lies, if that. But what they're not focused on is the that the, they tend to see things in a binary point of view, of like it's either going fine, I suppose that's how they put it, no problem, or it's a serious medical problem. And it's a very you, binary you, thing. Totally. I remember when we did a previous podcast, you're talking about reference ranges. It's like, it's all fine, 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 fine. Then it's really not fine. And you're like, but wait a minute, shouldn't there be more of a gradient here? Absolutely. And a spectrum, you know, like um, th they talk about that with certain disorders these days, that it's a spectrum. And I think everything's a spectrum. And so, yeah, the majority of practitioners don't understand that even if things are not yet in the red area, as you just said, in a reference range, like a... But, or, you know, sometimes this even has to be well outside the reference range for them to care. But the point is, there's a certain point at which they do care and a certain point at which they don't. And, and usually it's the point that they define it's a serious problem at which they start caring. And so that's most practitioners. And so, you know, this is just an example of expertise. I'm getting a bit deeper here than I was intending. But, you know, the expertise, not just in what to do or how to address it if it's seriously wrong, but the expertise in it's suboptimal, not a medical emergency yet, maybe not bad enough to be a medical problem yet, doesn't require medication yet maybe, but it is still bad enough to be significantly lowering the quality of your life, which a subclinical hypothyroidism certainly can and does do, for instance, um, and therefore it is worth addressing. And so, you know, and I'll give, as I said, specific examples going through it. But when I talk about expertise, I'm talking about someone who understands all of this. When I talk about, you know, suboptimal and it's on the spectrum and you want to get to multi-optimal end of the scale and all the rest of it. When I say expertise, having a doctorate does not mean that a person necessarily understands any of that stuff. And so you want the expertise of someone who is focused not just on fixing you once you get really, really bad, but actually looking at you and saying, wherever you're at, we want to try and get you to an optimal level. So that's more the type of expertise that I would be looking for. And probably if you're watching or listening to this, the kind of expertise that you're also looking for. But that's something that you want to uh, clarify at really the outset or as soon as possible with this person. And not to be bamboozled or hypnotized or whatever by the level of confidence they have and the level of certainty they have and the level of expertise that they quite you know often admittedly do have a dealing with serious medical emergencies it's like wow this person can save my life they save two people's lives before breakfast you know like it's very impressive and it is very impressive but that doesn't necessarily mean they have expertise to take you from feeling not great to feeling great that's a different set of expertise yeah, so finding out that clarification, that distinction between credentials versus expertise, practice, and has succeeded in the area that you're asking them or seeking advice and help from. Well, yeah, that leads us on to uh, another one on my list there. But let's start. <laughs> let's start. Okay. Let's start with just the expertise. Um, and again, not opposed to credentials. It's better to have both uh, if possible, but the expertise is more important. Uh, before I go to the one you were referencing there, Christine, let me bring up another one which I think is super, super important from my experience. And this is often a this is a deal breaker for me. And I wish I'd have learned this one earlier. And it's one we might talk about in another episode that we're planning to do at some point. And it is the quality of humility. Mm, oh yeah, hmm, very good. And unfortunately, um, you know, math mathematically, there is a inverse graph. Uh, is it inverse where the more <laughs> credentials and expertise goes up, the more humility tends to go down. And so um, it's difficult to find someone who has both of these qualities simultaneously. See, this is why I want to talk about this one next, because this is the one that balances out the other one. So why is, all right, why is humility super important as a general thing, as a human being? We'll talk about that maybe in another episode, but let's for now just focus on why it's super important for a practitioner. Because no one knows everything. Right. And so 
even if this person, and as I said, hopefully they do already have a large amount of expertise, and yes, as you were saying, Chris' experience, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, with um, with the you know the problem or the goal that you want to work with, um, their level of being willing to be open to what you have to say, to listen to you, to uh, not just listen, but to give credence to what you are saying, um, to also be open and give credence to other people, right? There may be other practitioners that are involved or that ultimately become involved and you want them to be open to uh, their perspective too. So let's say, you you know, we talked about the thyroid, you go to someone with thyroid, okay, but then it turns out you also have a, you know, SIBO, so maybe that's a different practitioner who specializes in that, so you gotta go to a different practitioner. So then you need, I mean, ideally you have one for both of those issues, but. Again, not always possible. So you need that both of them have the openness, the humility to be able to take feedback from and work with the other one rather than having this idea that, you know, I'm the only one who knows the right way. Now, then being able to work with other practitioners is probably secondary. The number one thing is that they listen to you. And why that's super important is because while they may have well, hopefully do have significantly more expertise than you in this particular area, they are the the one person who is definitely more of an expert on you than anyone else is you, right? So as diligent as they may be, as much as they may do research and looking at your history very thoroughly, you know, some functional medicine doctors will send you huge questionnaires that take you hours to fill out, maybe take them an hour to read, you know, it's like, uh, obviously, that's way better than a lot of doctors who spend 30 seconds browsing your medical history and then spend only five minutes talking to you. But I'm saying even at the extreme end where they really do their best um, and there is a value in them not being you because, of course, they're seeing it from the outside. They're seeing it from a third person perspective, which means, yes, they're going to see it without as much bias. They're going to see, it, you know, a fresh set of eyes, all the rest of it. So I'm not saying that all of that isn't valuable. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this episode. I do recommend you see practitioners. However, in some ways, you're going to be more of an expert on you than anyone else. And so someone who doesn't recognize that, any practitioner who doesn't recognize that and tries to make it like, yeah, you know, who show signs of not listening to you. I'll give you an example. Like just last year, uh, you know, I had this practitioner and, uh, you know, it's the first consult with them and they kept asking me questions that I'd already answered. So, right. so, right, right. so this was not, they... this was not even a mainstream doctor where you go in, they don't listen to you at all and they send you out within five minutes. No, no, no. This was a functional medicine doctor who makes you fill out the forms. You're supposed to spend an hour and a half getting to understand every facet of you. And yet still I could tell from the fact that they kept asking me questions about things that I already answered, that they were not really listening, right? They were going through a process that was predefined for them. But if they were actually open and listening, then when they got to that question, they'd be like, oh, yeah, he's, you know, he's already answered that. Let me da da da, right? Like, not make you say it all over again. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a niche case, but, you know, it's an example of how even you know, in subtle things like that, you can tell, even, you know, in that particular case, that type of practitioner is supposed to be very open, is supposed to, you know, seek to understand you to a very great depth and, and breadth. But there are, you know, little signs like that, that they weren't really actually listening, they weren't really open. And of course, actually, with that particular person, it did come across, they were arrogant, they were dismissive, and all of that kind of stuff that, you know, you wouldn't want in any practitioner, that they were the opposite of humble and otherwise. But that was the first indicator before any of that other stuff showed up. Um, so, you know, yeah, uh, humility is hugely important to balance, balance of expertise. And so finding someone with credentials is super easy. Finding someone with credentials plus genuine expertise is, you know, diff moderately easy or difficult depending on where you live. But finding someone with a high level of expertise and a high level of humility is fairly difficult, but super, super worthwhile. And not impossible. Definitely not impossible. No, I've met a bunch yeah. of them. Uh, I try and feature them on the show where I can, you know, um, when I do come across them, either... Uh, I can tell, you know, because they've worked with me, like in the case of Dr. Miriam, or just, you know, they interview me and I have conversations with them and I can just tell that they are a person who's actually, you know, open and, and uh, not, you know, not arrogant. And uh, so I, and I will continue to try and bring as many of them onto the show 
uh, as possible <laughs> to both first of all give you leads I guess for people you could maybe potentially work with and secondarily just to give you examples like yes these people do exist <laughs> <laughs> beautiful I mean, those are really great points so yes the expertise and the humility are absolute wonderful things that to be looking for because then as well you know for where I would go is having that confidence that ah this person is really going to work with me yes yeah absolutely um, so I'll try and buzz through these other ones a bit quicker because I spent a long time on those two, but they are the most important. That's why they're at the top of the list. Um, curiosity, I think, is probably a part of openness, but it's just not necessarily there. So curiosity, I'd say, is kind of an aspect of humility, but I wanted to highlight it. Um, why I think that's so important is because um, I think the, the degree to which the person is curious unless you're very lucky and they really are already an expert on your very specific combination of things, the degree that they have curiosity is the degree that they will probably end up being successful with you because they are asking questions, they are interested, they want to know, they want to work it out. It's, you know, it's a puzzle for them, however you want to put it. Um, and so again, asking questions, not just because it's on a form, but the degree to which they seem genuinely interested and the amount of different questions that they ask, uh, to me, is a very good indicator of their ultimate level of success. And, um, you know, I, I, I could have put in questions like determination and stuff, but unfortunately, uh, sorry, uh, uh, qualities like determination in my list here, but the, and determination is a good quality for, you know, a practitioner, but the point is how are you going to know that for sure unless you've already been with them for a while? Um, but the curiosity is something that you can see right from the outset. Are they actually interested? It doesn't mean they have to necessarily care about you, you know, deep in your soul or whatever. If if they more see you just as a puzzle to figure out, I'd say, you know, that's potentially okay. Like the main thing is that they want to work it out and that they are open to your input, as we've already talked about. Um, but just, yeah, curiosity in general is a very valuable quality in a practitioner I have found. Fantastic. I mean, and maybe this will be on there too. It's like when, uh, maybe on your list, but where they're also just in that space of, I like it like a new blank canvas as you appear. Yes, they've seen many other people before, but I'm me and I'm unique. So if they're curious and interested into discovering, oh, how can I really help this individual? Then yeah, another great quality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, you're right. That's really what I meant by curiosity, right? Because as you say, each person is different. Yes, your particular collection of what's, you know, could, whatever's going on could be very similar to someone else. And so it's true. Maybe if you're lucky, they don't have to ask any questions because they really have already figured it out. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not, you know, super common, especially the more complex your particular case does get. Um, and often things are not as simple as they seem, you know, and everyone falls into this trap. I do too. You know, you see people and you see them making some really obvious mistakes and, you, and they have some very obvious things going on, which are often a consequence of those mistakes. And it's very easy to go into the trap of, uh, oh, well, you know, that's it. But I always try and stay open and curious about what am I missing? What else might be going on? And yeah, I do think that's very important. Uh, the next quality you did hint at earlier, and I put it, you know, for, for a reason, even though for some people they may think it's, you know, first. And honestly, it's the same when I'm hiring people as well. And it's experience. And so experience is important. Obviously, if I have an issue, I would much rather work with someone who has dealt with a hundred times than zero. Mm. Um, but it's not the most important thing for me. And there can be downsides to the person having worked with that already a lot, as we just talked about, right? They can get more and more, uh, you know, less, less curious, more and more rigid, more and more dogmatic in their approach, thinking it's just the same thing as it has been for everyone else. And while they may be right, you know, they may also be wrong. Um, and so, yeah, quali experience is a helpful quality. And when you're interviewing a practitioner, it's definitely a useful question to ask them. But it's not the primary criteria, because as we just said, those, especially first two criteria, are already quite not you know super easy to find so i would rather work with someone who has a high degree of expertise like they actually really understand the principles of what's going on and they have a high hum degree of humility which would include curiosity than if they for instance had no humility no curiosity but they had experience like that's that would be my preference structure and what i'd Beautiful. encourage for you as well yeah I mean, very well said yeah it's, and it's interesting because these are you know I don't know if I ever thought about these 
qualities before when seeking a practitioner. It was more just like, oh God, can you help me? Can you help me? Instead of really, you know, digging down into, oh, do they have this? Do they have that? Mm, you know, so this is good. This is really good. Yeah. And I realized, you know, people listening to this are like, who live in a country of socialized healthcare where you basically you're assigned a doctor and that's it. Um, I mean, that's not even true, right? Like, I mean, even living in a small village, I had a choice of saying, okay, uh, you know, I don't want to go to this practice. I, I want to go to this practice instead. Certainly if you live in a town or a city, that's even easier. You can choose, you know, I know it's a hassle and it takes time every time and it's like an admin hassle and all the rest of it. And that's, I think, why a lot of people don't move or they don't want the social awkwardness. Fantastic. What's next on the list, Owen? So um, I already touched upon this, but a lack of dogmatism. If you've watched all my episodes, you've certainly heard me talk about this before. Um, any practitioner who tries to fit you into a one size fits all approach is almost certainly wrong. And unfortunately, I thought this might be on your list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of them do it. And now, that's not to say there can't be commonalities. The, you know, as I said, I talk about fire a lot, but plenty of places, in fact, you know, I've had quite a few clients come to me who, because I talk about it a lot, they're like, must apply to me too. And I look at them and I'm like, eh, not really, you know, like <laughs> I'm very open always to what it is. And I don't try and fit them into a, a specific system. Um, so this one is a little bit difficult to tell again, if you don't know much about them, right? If you're just showing up. And so this is where the ideal thing is to do a bit of recon. Um, go to their website, if they have any social media, if they have an Instagram account, if they have, a, you know, ideally a YouTube channel or something where there's long form content, like take the time or a podcast or whatever, take the time to actually listen to them or read and hear about their approach. Um, just from that, you can get a reasonable idea of if they're dogmatic or not, right? If they use codes like everyone and always and all that kind of thing. That's, you know, obvious. Yeah, I was going to say, what are the telling signs for, if to, for somebody to figure that out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, making blankets, uh, blanket sweeping statements um, that lack any degree of nuance or context. Uh, so everyone needs to do this. No one should do this. Always this. You know, all of that kind of stuff is very obvious. If there's a lot of this is right, this is wrong without context, then that's another classic indicator. Uh, I'm right, or this person's right, this person's wrong, even. Any kind of you know, dogmatism, it's, I guess it's not a word that's used that commonly anymore, but what it basically means is uh, like an excess of certainty which reduces accuracy and truthfulness. I don't know if that's dictionary definition, but that's how I would put it. Um, it's where people are, it, you know, it often goes hand in hand with religion, that's one of the criti criticisms of religion, right? If you're one of our group, then you are saved or whatever. And if you're not, then you're damned and that's it. Uh, but of course, these days, scientific um, institutions are often exactly the same. Political institutions are exactly the same. And yeah, health institutions are exactly the same. There's this like, it's my way or be damned kind of thing. Or And sometimes it's a bit more subtle than that. It's like, it's, you know, this way. Yeah, or be damned, right? It's not necessarily my way, but it's this thing that I'm a part of. And so, uh, the I, you know, I have two issues with it. Um, first of all, it's a bit distasteful that it has that kind of, uh, what's the word, dismissing of everyone else, but the in-group quality to it. But I'm not, I'm not that bothered about that. The thing that I dislike about it primarily is simply the lack of accuracy, that it's just wrong unfortunately, to treat everyone as if they're the same is just inaccurate. Um, now, if it's a fairly binary issue, like people are either this way or not, then, it, you know, you could have millions or, I guess, depending on the scale of your reach, over a billion followers, all of whom you're right about because you're right about it with half of people, right? So that is possible. And so that's why these people can often have, all these systems can have huge followings of people who all say that it's brilliant and it works for me and it's 100% right and all the rest of it. And if you happen to fall into one of these groups or one of these dogmatic uh, uh, gurus or practitioners or whatever, it's very easy if you're already feeling insecure and overwhelmed and uncertain to feel like that, that certainty and that confidence they have is like a warm blanket of you know, like security, it makes you feel all warm inside. Okay, I finally found someone who knows what's what and 
now I can, uh, now I know too, and I can stop feeling so anxious and worrying. And, you know, so there's all those benefits emotionally, but the problem is the lack of accuracy. And if they happen to be giving you advice that, as I said, is completely opposite to what you need uh, or what is helpful for you, which is frequently the case, then you can be in a situation where you are feeling worse and worse. And this is the classic telltale of dogmatism, by the way, because some people do make blanket statements, like I was saying earlier, but they do it more as a selling or a marketing technique to get people in the door. So that's kind of mm, forgivable-ish in, in terms of marketing materials and stuff like that. But the most important thing is how they treat you if what they recommend to you is not working for you. And if they treat you as if it is your fault, um, you must not be doing it correctly, you must not be doing it enough. You know, as I said, I've lost, I feel almost like a, I mean, I'm not, but I feel almost like a soldier who's lost like friends in this war of health to, you know, people who've become aligned with and loyal to these particular dogmatic gurus and whose health has declined more and more. And, and I know, you know, when I talked to them, they were like, oh yeah, the problem is I just wasn't sticking to this extreme thing enough. You know, I was doing it like I was 95% fruitarian or I was 95% carnivore or I was 95% keto or whatever, but I didn't stick to it. And that's the problem. That's why it wasn't working. And I'm like, Ugh, okay, you know, um, <laughs> I'm like, did you ever do 100%? Yeah, but it was so hard <laughs> to stick to. And, you know, I fell off and I didn't give it a chance yeah. to work. And so then for that would be like, well, and so then maybe it's not right. Yeah. And, uh, and if the person, this is why, you know, I'm blaming them. As much as I want everyone to take personal responsibility, I am blaming the dogmatic practitioner or guru here more because I understand that as much as I'd love it if everyone was like fully autonomous, um, you know, independently minded people, most who think for themselves and question authority, most people aren't, you know, they're just not built that way. Uh, they're built to follow, they're built to look at the authority figure and look at everyone around them and basically do what everyone around them is doing. Even if what everyone around them, you know, is like a subgroup and most of the world is not doing that thing, but if everyone within their group, uh, their subgroup is doing that thing, then they, you know, they just believe that that is the way and they ignore the evidence of their own senses. And so, yeah, that's why it's very hard to resist that for the vast majority of people once you're ready in it. And that's why I want to encourage people to be on the lookout for it in the first place to, you know, not fall into it in the first place. Because, yeah, depending, again, on your personality or the rest, I'd say at least 80% of people, it's extremely difficult to resist once you're already in it. So a much better strategy um, is to avoid getting in it in the first place. So uh, if you're attracted to that level of certainty and, dog, you know, arrogance and confidence and all the rest and, you know, you're not going to listen to me on that and you do get involved with people anyway because you like that in someone and I understand that because I find certainty and confidence very entertaining and, uh, I, you know, I'm open to it. But you have to have this line with yourself that as, it, as soon as they start blaming you for your lack of success, even when you are, uh, you know, following their system to a large degree, let's just say, then that has to be a red flag or a line, a red line in the sand where you're like, okay, I, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and it's not always them, you know, it's not always the practitioner or the guru or whatever. Sometimes it's the their group, right? It's their mods online. It's their, you know, right hand man or woman. It's their second in commands and all the rest of it who do that more. Uh, but, you know, no matter who it is, if, if, that's the overall messaging you're getting. If there's if there's too little curiosity, hmm, I wonder why it could be it's not working, and too much, it must be your fault. Um, then I would strongly recommend uh, to move on. And as I said, I strongly recommend not to get involved with those kind of people and systems in the first place. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things that we have discussed, you know, quite a few times. Is this health is not always a one size fits all. It just can't be. I mean, we are very unique in all different ways. And that's where it's also being like, okay, well, let me listen to my body. Does this feel right for my body? I know it says it works for everybody. And my best friend told me it worked for her, but wait a minute, there's something that doesn't quite feel right for me. Yep. It's definitely not. I you know uh, the rejuvenate blueprint. I'm working with someone right now, um, you know, marketing and they're like, they're not sure if we should call it a blueprint. And I was like, and they're like, is it a blueprint? And I'm like, yeah, you know, cause to me it's the, the blueprint is, um, you find out, uh, which of the seven 
possible root causes applied to you and then you test and then you you know experiment until you find what it is and because you're working on the weakest links you usually have rapid progress and all that and that's great but then i do get feedback like i remember there was a someone watched the blueprint episode and they're like where is the blueprint there's just a bunch of people talking and i'm like i'm not quite sure what they're expecting but then i realized what they're probably expecting is like Step one, do this no matter what. Step two, do this no matter what. And of course, that isn't. Well, then that what would be is. instructions for me. That's instructions because that's those action steps. But the blueprint is telling you the different areas. I mean, maybe they just need I a visual. So. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, to me, blueprint does imply more map or, you know, like a, as you say, a guide rather than a rigid set of instructions, as you say. Yeah, I, but I look at it like your house. You know, your architect, they've got the blueprint of the house. Okay, you got your master bedroom, you got your living room. So it's like, yeah. So you've got up here, you've got your genetics. Over here, you've got your nutrients, you know, and yeah, so on and so forth. It's a blueprint of how things could go wrong, right? That's and, and what you can do about it. But yeah, anyway, uh, I think I, <laughs> a lot of people are expecting a simple set of instructions or a diet to follow or whatever, because that's usually what's out there. Um, anyway, so I've talked enough about that, as you say, on other episodes as well. A um, couple more qualities. So... This one kind of relates, uh, I guess, to earlier ones, but I want to be specific about it. How clear are they in their communication? And the measure of that is how understandable you find them. So this is something I'm always trying to calibrate. And usually I get quite good feedback on that, which I'm happy with. Like people say, not always, as in that case, but, uh, you know, generally people say, oh, you make things that are complicated seem easy to understand, Owen, which is great. That's what I'm aiming for, at least for, you know, I can't do it for everyone, but for the people who I'm hoping to help, my, uh, I guess, target audience or whatever you'd call it. But, um, you know, you're the target audience of this practitioner, right? And so the crucial thing is, and this you know, includes me too, if you find me incomprehensible, I'm not the practitioner for you, right? You have to have someone who... You understand what they say. Now, obviously, when you're talking about practitioner, it's more of a conversation, two ways, rather than a podcast. And so it's possible you might not understand something first time. And you can say, you know, can you repeat that? Or, you know, is there a different way you can explain that or something? But, and and how the person handles that is important as well, right? Um, something I've learned, I'm not sure if I said this on the podcast, but like, yeah, I think I said it in a recent episode, uh, I'll just say it again quickly, that when you speak to people who are supposed to be experts in something and then you ask them clarifying questions about a specific technical point, and remember, you know, they may be much more of an expert in, I don't know, nutrition than you, but because you have an issue with, I don't know, vitamin uh, C or whatever, you might have really done a lot of research with vitamin C and you might know some stuff about vitamin C that they don't know, even though they're a nutritionist. And... If when you ask questions about that, they kind of either give very technical answers um, or are kind of dismissive, like, oh, you wouldn't understand. Often, and people don't actually say that, but it's do they make you feel that way with what they're mm -hmm. saying is more what matters. People rarely, you know, come out and say that these days. I think with the, uh, what's the word, democratization of ideas, like authorities don't get away of being that arrogant anymore overall. But still, if that's the kind of impression that you're ultimately left with, like, oh, you know, this is above you or beyond you. Um, what I've realized fairly recently is it actually can just be because they don't know the answer. And so it's kind of like a bluff to make you, um, to kind of put it back on you. It's kind of like projecting that because they they don't even know the answer so you definitely wouldn't be able to understand the answer so you know that's why they're doing it um and so making sure that, that you can understand what they're saying uh that you can understand why they're recommending what they're recommending making sure you understand what they're recommending <laughs> uh you know that, that all the details of it are clear to you uh, are hugely important because it doesn't matter how much how good they are in every other sense if you basically leave that meeting not really knowing what you're supposed to do or not really being clear why you're supposed to do it that is a huge um uh, uh you know problem and you might say well okay knowing what i need to do obviously matters owen because you know uh if i don't know what i need to do then i'm not going to do it and not going to get progress but why does the why matter so much 
The reason why the why matters so much is because a lot of the benefit of what we do is not purely only based on what we do, it's actually understanding why. And so there are studies on this um, that, you know, if you take, say, you know, you eat a certain food, take a certain nutrient or even certain medication, um, if you're just taking it because someone said so, the beneficial impact that it has is significantly less than if you feel like you, you know, let's say thoroughly understand the mechanism of how it works. There's something about understanding it that significantly boosts like the placebo effect benefit as well. Um, and so it is very important to, to understand the why, in my opinion. And so any pr practitioner who is like, just do this because I told you so, again, if they won't usually say that directly these days, but if that's their kind of bottom line. Now, sometimes there isn't time to explain everything. I, I often don't, but what I do is I give people links. I'm like, you know, here's my recommendation for cholestasis, and here's a two-hour video where I talk about why. You know, it's up to you if you want to watch it. Hopefully you will. Um, but yeah, to give, I guess, at least resources, plenty of information as to why a person should actually do it, uh, I, I believe is very important as well. Definitely, because then it also puts the power back into their hands. And as we've talked about previously as well, it's that, you know, placebo effect, there's that nocebo effect, you know, all of that. The power of the mind plays such an impact in our health. So absolutely having that why, because it will maybe take you that extra further step that you really need to go. Yes. Yeah, 100%. And then uh, one of the elements I have in the list here is reliability. Now... You could say this is a bit like perseverance, like how do you know unless you've really worked with them for a while or determination or however I put it earlier. But I think reliability is something that you actually can get clues on early on. Now, some people are a little bit extreme with this, like if someone's two minutes late for a meeting or whatever, they're like, oh, I can't trust them, I can't rely on them. Yeah, I don't mind if a practitioner is even five or 10 minutes late. You've got to understand the practitioners often they're stacked, you know, one person after the other or whatever. It's not the end of the world. Admittedly, if they're making you sit there for like an hour waiting, that's uh, not great. But, you know, that might be a little bit of a red flag. Um, but when I say reliability, I, I mean less about uh, necessarily timing where I am willing to be a bit more flexible. But I mean more like, do they do what they say? Um, so if they say... I will send you this by this time or this date or whatever. Do they do it? And if they don't, because again, we're all humans and some humans do have a tendency to um, over um, estimate what we are capable of doing in a certain period of time. Um, and while it's not a perfect character trait, it is unfortunately quite a common one among people who want to help people. So again, unfortunately, um, if you want someone with all the other qualities, they might also have the quality of overestimating what they're capable of. But at the very least, like, how do they handle that? You know, like, if you then say, hi, you know, I, th uh, I thought you were going to send me this or whatever, do they then, like, ignore you and then, you know, respond three days later with the thing without any acknowledgement that it's late? Or do they straight away get back to you and say, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I know I said I was going to do it, I've had a delay... Or, you know, if that isn't possible, you know, sometimes, especially if you're working with medical doctors, maybe they are dealing with medical emergencies, right? You have to, again, be a bit flexible. But basically, you know, ideally, are they reliable that they just do what they say? But at the very least, because as I say, that isn't always possible for various reasons with practitioners, do, are they, do they acknowledge um, what they have said? Because if they don't even do that, and that's something that might happen even before you ever first speak to them, you know, uh, maybe, maybe you, uh, you know, they, they say, oh, you know, you ask when they're available and they say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll reply tomorrow with some times and then they never do or whatever, you know, like these are red flags. I would say that, you know, there's one of those sayings, um, I think this comes from a Japanese concept, Kaizen, like, but it's how you do anything is how you do everything. And it's an unpleasant slogan for certain people who, live in a world of excuses because it's like they want to believe that everything is an exception and everything is, uh, you know, this doesn't count, right? But <laughs> in reality, in life, everything counts, you know? Yeah. Every calorie you eat count, every poison that you ingest counts, 
Uh, and every good thing you do counts, right? Every good, every generous act you do of another human being counts, and every uh, moment that you're outside with sunlight and fresh air counts, or whatever, right? Like it all counts, and it all counts, and therefore, you know, unless it's a really horrifically extreme thing, one negative thing doesn't offset all that good that you've done. So that's the good news. But on the other hand, if it, if this is why I say it matters more how they deal with not doing what they said rather than just because if they just completely ignore that they haven't done what they said. What that says to me is that um, either they have a like lack of humility to be able to acknowledge they made a mistake, which is not good, or not doing what they said they're going to do is so common for them that they don't feel any uh, need to acknowledge it, which you know is a red flag for a different reason. And so, yeah, I would say that is something that you often can see pretty quickly with a practitioner. And it's up to you if you make that a deal breaker. I mean, I put it right at the bottom of the list for a reason. I, personally, I'd say if someone meets every other criteria there, I might be willing to live with that one. But if you've already got a, you know, a few of these criteria that are not fitting, that, that one could be the thing that tips you over the edge to go, you know what, I think I could find someone who's uh, more suited to me. Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. Really great list of qualities. So just to recap, we're starting off at the top with the expertise. Coming in second is humility. And then we have curiosity, experience, lack of dogmatism, <laughs> Clarity, understandability, and reliability. Yes. So this is such a good list. And did it take you a long time to compile this list or was it just like that for you? Like, honestly, just five minutes. But that's because I've been you know, processing it in my subconscious for a while, like how to guide people on this. So yeah, I don't know. It depends how you measure these things. Um, do you think I've missed anything, Chrissy? Is there anything else that you would add? I think if if some if the practitioner has all of these qualities, because the only other thing that I would say here would be that that bedside manner that somebody has in the way that they deliver it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if they have all these qualities, it could pretty much tick the box. But that is the only other thing that I would say is you know how they potentially deliver or have that um, compassion with you. It's, in, in, in it's typical of me that I would leave that off. Um, yeah, that's why, like, I mean, this is a personal preference, right? For some people that matters more. Like I said, to me, if they, um, if they don't really care about my well-being, except for that I'm like a puzzle that they want to solve, I'm actually okay with that, right? If, yeah, if they're going to get me over the line, I'm good with that too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I mean, right? Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of how they deal with you, maybe in terms of treating you with respect and all that kind of stuff. But I feel like, as you said, that probably be largely covered by qualities like, uh, you know, humility, 
um, and curiosity. But yeah, you're right. It still doesn't guarantee that they're going to really deeply care about your well-being. That would be a separate quality. And so if you need to feel that from someone in order to feel comfortable with them, then absolutely you should add that to the list. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, we also go down to, I think we discussed this previously as well. Um, just the power that that white coat or that that person in authority does have. You did touch on that in, in this list here of just, you know, and again, that's why I say, I think with this, this list, which is pretty comprehensive, that should kind of be tied up in here. Maybe they're not going to be like, oh, you know, like really here in that way, but then at least they won't be like, ah, you know, in that regard. So yeah, it's a really good list. It's a really good list. Let me ask you this. Um, does somebody need to be the role model of all of God, these are the updates? I don't know how they At least you want to <laughs> Let me ask you this. So does somebody need to really be the perfect role model for this? I mean, like, how does somebody, I, like, I look at it from this, this regard. Okay. If I want to go to somebody for my hairdresser, if I don't like their hair, I'm really not going to go there. How, is there a way to equate that here in the world of health with these practitioners? That's a really interesting question. And it's funny about, you said about hairdresser because, um, Hairdressers tend to have like ridiculous hairstyles that I would never dream of having in a million years. I've always kind of noticed that. I mean, not always, but often. Um, yeah, well, funny you talk about hair because actually that I did get a question recently that I was like, I want to actually address this on the podcast. It's not because it's negative. I've got plenty in it. It kind of even wasn't negative. I, I'm going to take this as a sincere question. Uh, so someone said on YouTube under one of my videos, they said, uh, why did you lose your hair? Uh, is that a genetic or imbalance of hormones you never corrected? Um, Dr. Pete thought it was prolactin and estrogen being elevated, thyroid being low, uh, excess polyunsaturated fats, etc. What's your answer and thoughts on it? So I wanted to address that at some point. I think now is as good a time as any because I think it's actually a really good question and it's a fair question. So to go back to what you said about role model. So I do have some thoughts about this. So on the one hand... Um, to take advice from someone on something that they have completely failed to achieve themselves is questionable and dubious, right? So to get, you know, um, how to get rich advice from someone who's obviously poor, to get how to be in a happy relationship advice from someone who's obviously, you know, single. <laughs> and yes, to get health advice from someone who's obviously unhealthy, or, you know, maybe how to to get how to lose weight advice from someone who's overweight, all of that kind of stuff. Um, on a kind of surface level, it is obviously uh, foolish. And, you know, it's, I mean, you know, on the hair question, I haven't done a how to regrow your hair if you're bald episode. And I don't, you know, I don't think I would um, unless things changed. And, it, you know, and we'll talk about my hair in a second, but just be more general for a second before that. So, however... I do think that, the, that that perspective can be taken too far, and I think it is, and I'll tell you why. Um, so there's a few different reasons. One of them is that, so I, I first became, I know it's probably like ingrained in human beings that they want to kind of take advice from someone who they feel has already got to where they want to go. So I realize that's probably a very primitive, animalistic, and not to say bad, you know, but you know, like a, what's the word, pre-programmed perspective. But I, I, f I remember I first came across it like intellectualized in the realm of uh, NLP. And so there's this idea in NLP called modeling and really it just means role modeling. And the concept is really simple. It's like, if you want to achieve something, you just find someone who's already achieved it and you kind of work backwards to how they did it and do the same thing that they did. And I'd say there's a lot of validity to that, and, but it also has its limitations. So first of all, I'd say often there's a misunderstanding there that people take that, but then they shift it. And rather than saying, okay, I'm going to find someone who had the same problems as me and then overcame it and now is doing well in the way that I want to, let me look at what the, what they did when they were struggling as much as me and how they the process that they went through to no longer be struggling often that's not what people do because they're simplistic and they just go oh what's that person doing now that's what i want to do too 
So mm-hmm. let's take diet as an example, right? A lot of people who are obsessed with diet, focused on diet. And so they will say, okay, what kind of person has the body already that I want? You know, men, six pack abs, biceps, whatever, you know, women, hourglass figure, small waist, whatever. And then um, what are they eating now? And let me copy them. So there's a couple of problems with that. Well, probably more than a couple, but let me bring up some of the more obvious ones. So first of all, how you get to something is often very different to how you maintain something. This is really, really obviously illustrating the case of wealth, right? Let's say you want to be a millionaire or even a billionaire, and right now you're dead broke and in debt. The way that a person works and saves and invests who's already a millionaire or a billionaire even if you scale it back and like do your version of it with whatever little resources are available to you, if you follow the same strategy as them, it likely will not work at all. Because the strategy of someone who's already attained the rarefied heights of something is radically different from the strategy of someone who is still struggling right at the beginning. I remember there was a good book about this by a guy called uh, Roger Hamilton. I think it was called The Millionaire Master Plan. And he basically talks about like nine levels of health, wealth creation all the way from being broke and more in debt every month was like the bottom level. And then the level above that was just being broke and treading water and then, you know, uh, earning some money and being able to save a tiny bit every month. And it was like going up like that one step at a time. And he showed that the key to getting to the next level varied massively in each case, depending on what level you're at. So the correct strategy for going from more in debt every month to breaking even treading water is very different to going from treading water to saving a bit, which is very different from going, you know, to saving a bit to actually being able to start to invest in stuff and on and on and on. Like they're they're all completely different strategies. They require completely different attitudes. Um, And so with with uh, health it's, and fitness, it's not quite as simple and obvious as that. Or maybe it is. Maybe someone will decode it just like that guy did for health. I'll be interested. Maybe I'll be the one to do it or someone else does it. I'll be very interested to see it. But it, it, there is a rough equivalent. So um, trying to model people as in just doing what they're doing when they're already there. So this is why when people ask me, what, what do you currently eat? I, I usually refuse to answer. Not because... I mean, actually, I've done a couple of episodes now where I do talk about it, but... No, but I I get it. That makes sense because how you got yourself to today to be able to eat what you're eating is not what you started with way back then. No, you know, and I I still eat in a very restricted way because it's simpler and, you know, and easier generally these days and it makes me feel my best and I don't miss anything, right? If you're eating, as far as I'm concerned, what everything I eat is delicious. (laughs) I'm very happy with it. But um, yeah, so... so, but, you know, as I said, that it may well be completely wrong for someone else, depending on what stage they're at. Or, and this leads me to my second objection to the whole theory, the way, and, and you know, again, I'm giving a lot of credit to this guy today, uh, I think it's Roger James Hamilton, but he also had his uh, system called Wealth Dynamics, I think. And he talked about like there's eight different types of wealth creators. And depending on your kind of personality and your temperament and stuff like that, like, some people are going to be do really well at like trading and some people are going to work, work very well at accumulating and some people can work very well at like being very social and connecting others and some people doing very well at creating and some people doing very well at building systems. And anyway, there's lots of different paths to wealth, right? And it depends partly on your type. Well, as I've tried to lay out in detail in my... Um, rejuvenate blueprint and these episodes and all the rest of it there's lots of different paths to health and it depends a lot on your starting place and this is why i recommend genetic insights uh or something you know equivalent always as the first step because you want to see just like with that guy system with the wealth thing what is your starting place because depending on your starting place that will significantly alter the strategy that you need to take to reach a level of optimization and so the other problem is you know you know, let's just say diet, right? Let's pick a simple example. Uh, some people do well with even the high carbs and simple carbs. And I believe you're one of those types genetically, Chrissy. Um, and some people do not. And even complex carbs, they don't do well with and they do do better, you know, ketogenic or close to ketogenic diet and they have more hand-together ancestors. So in both cases, 
if you, if the person who you are trying to model, role model, or follow is the opposite type of you, then even if you're following their how they got their strategy and not their what they're doing now strategy, it could still be totally and utterly wrong for you because it's wrong for your specific type. And that's a very simplistic yes or no carbs thing, but you know, as we talked about, we've done it in previous episodes, with all you know, each of about 60 nutrients, you might need more than someone else, you might need less than someone else. And so if you're not accounting for that, you could be doing exactly the same with as them. You might even have exactly the same circumstances and all the rest as them, and you still might fail where they succeeded because you just have a different starting place. You have a different blueprint. And so this is, you know, super, super important to uh, qualify. So that's one of the other things. Now, a third objection I have, and this brings us back full circle a little bit more to um, the question I got, which again, I didn't take as a, an insult. It seemed like a very, um, you know, earnest and sincere question to me, and it's a fair question. Um, it And actually, it wasn't to do with this more. I think it was to do with someone else. It was one of my guests. Someone made a comment about how they didn't look great or something like that. And I was just like, I, I don't want to name them because I don't want to be negative about anyone, but I just thought like, this person before was seriously, ser they, they were already reasonably old and they were seriously, seriously unwell, like life-threateningly unwell. And now, you know, X amount of years later, they are very well and looking better than they were, significantly better than they were before. And so I think that has to be taken into account. And so, yes, I do get it that, taking weight loss advice from someone who's more overweight from you is, you know, counterintuitive and seems silly on the surface level. And it may be, but what if they, uh, you know, I had a friend who, who did this. Um, he was, I think he was 400 pounds and he went down to 190 pounds. He was still a bit overweight because I think he was five foot eight or something like that. He wasn't hugely tall. So he probably could have done with being 170 pounds or something like that. And so you could have looked at him and go, eh, he's still a bit overweight. I'm not going to listen to him about weight loss advice. But it's like, but he lost more than half his own body weight. Like he obviously knows something about how to lose weight, even though he's not a picture perfection of, you know, exactly how you might want to look. And I can tell you, Chrissy, from my own experience, when I had my struggles a few years ago that I talk about a lot and especially other people's podcasts where I saw dozens of practitioners and maybe a dozen doctors you know specialists and stuff and then several emergency room visits as well where I saw various doctors and um, the least helpful person I saw of all by far was this person who someone else recommended to me again I'm not trying to cause a beef of anyone so I'm not giving any identifying characteristics but they were someone who someone else recommended for, to me and, um, and they were fairly expensive as well. And I got on this call with them and they just started giving me this completely generic advice that if they'd have listened to what I told them beforehand, they would know that it wasn't applicable. It wasn't going to help. I'd already explained why. And But here's the important point. When I started pointing this out, their defense is, their defense was, I've never been sick a day in my life, so I know what I'm talking about. And and I tell you, this was the, as I said, you think like an emergency room doctor who thinks that you're a hypochondriac and that you're imagining things is unhelpful. They were sometimes like, they, they would give me like one piece of information that might be a little bit helpful, right? Like there was, as long as I maintained humble and curious, I could always glean something of some helpfulness from everyone. You could take a morsel for sure. Uh, so let me ask you, what which um, which quality did that fall under? Non-humbleness or a more dogmatic space? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, very high levels of both, right? Like, which was the worst element of it? Um, well, the first thing was dogmatism, right? Just giving me this one size fits all thing. But the, yeah, I mean, the... I've never been sick a day in my life. Yeah. The, 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 I know what I'm talking about. The degree yeah. of hubris or arrogance. Um, and so, you know, I would warn people actually that maybe the ones who seem the healthiest, they are often the least helpful because they have no concept of what it actually is. Because again, we all have different starting places. Now, you know, this is talked a lot about socioeconomically, right? Imagine you were born into a rich family with 
you know, private tutors, private school, connections, all the rest of it, and every advantage given to you. And then you had people coming to you and you, t you, you know, you claim to teach people about how to be wealthy. And then your advice is like, oh, it's easy to be wealthy. Like you just follow my system and yeah, you've got to spend this much money. And then the person's like, I, I don't even, I don't even have that much money. And they're like, hey, I've never been poor a day in my life. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. You have to listen to me. I mean, like how utterly stupid and insulting and unhelpful would that be if it, it, no one would do that in a socioeconomic theme because, you know, they, they would know the response they get. But this actually happens in the health world all the time. And it is... Yeah. Yeah, no, it definitely does. Because uh, I remember um, there is a, was a program over here. I think it's uh, been gone for a while now. It was called Fit to Fat to Fit. And it would have these trainers. They were working with these people that were overweight. And the trainers would have to put on 20 to 30 pounds and then lose it with their, um, with their client. Some trainers were, you know, successful. and But there was like the, the odd couple here that really struggled getting back to where they were. So it, it put that into perspective. But yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from with, with that. So it's really good, good, good point. Awesome. And the last one I'll put just for this, should you be you know, looking for a moral model in a practitioner, is to say that appearances can be deceiving. Now, this has been the case throughout history. Um, you know, still 100 years ago, someone may look ha you know, healthy, and in fact, they're not. You know, models... Famously, I know you were a model, Christy. I mean, you are, a, well, sorry, are a model. You are an exception in that you are genuinely healthy, but I'm sure you could regale us with all kinds of stories, which I'm not asking you to because it's confidential, but, you know, of all kinds of models who are, you know, actually extremely unhealthy, right, with all kinds of health issues. I know I've heard from plenty of them. I've had some of them as clients. Um, and so the other thing that we have to remember is what looks good isn't necessarily what actually is good. So that's true hundred years ago. Now, since then, we've had, you know, cosmetic surgery of all that kind of stuff, and it's become more and more available to everyone, and fake this and fake that, and these days there's like filters and this and that, and so um, basically appearances can very much be deceiving, and of course, some of the top influencers are accused of that, right? They Photoshop all their pictures to, to make them look better than, you know, they actually look and all the rest of it, and even videos can be Photoshopped these days, and blemishes can be removed and, and this and that and the other and I you know I can say that other than having reasonably good lighting because lighting is something subjective I do nothing to make myself uh, look better for any recording any photo any anything um, and I don't believe you do either Chrissy um, no I just got my ring lights which is nice and a little bit of blush and whatnot so. <laughs> a little bit so. of makeup okay so cheating a little yeah, bit yeah but, but li lighting is helpful <laughs> you know nice lighting is helpful yeah yeah but again it's not lying because obviously you know if there were no light you wouldn't be able to see us at all so it's just picking a light that you know makes you look better rather than worse uh, but that's it that's all either of us do um, a little bit of makeup, you said, but I don't think you use a lot either. Um, certainly not for someone who's a model, no. So um, that's not the case for most people. So we have to realise as well the amount of deceit that's going on in the appearance of people uh, and bear that in mind. Um, uh, but yeah, I'd say I kind of went off point there actually because the, mo the more important point is how you look is not really necessarily a reflection of what's inside. It can be. It's not like something that has no, that means nothing and should be completely ignored, but it is not a reliable indicator um, either. So I could comment, uh, com uh, comment a little bit about my own health issues here, I think, and then we'll yeah, go back I to think the this, point. Yeah, this is a really good point because I think too, people are very interested, uh, you know, where you've gone, how you found your, your um, path through your health journey. So I think that's something that would be wonderful to be dis discussed here. Okay. Well, I can say, I mean, you know, I discussed this last week when we were considering if we do an episode on this and, you know, you said you thought I look significantly better now than I did before when I met you in, you know, when I was 35 and now 44, I think. Um, maybe we can actually put a photo in here. If we remember the editor, we can give a, you know, what I used to look like picture, like a before and after. Um, so I think the hair is the main thing. That's the one area where I, you know, definitely look worse or older or whatever. So yeah, let me address it. Uh, so this person asked, is it genetic or an imbalance of hormones? Is it prolactin? Is it estrogen? Is it low thyroid? Is it, 
um, high pollen saturated fats. They, that was all this person's guesses. And I would say, you know what? Great guesses. Like it's, <laughs> it's pretty much every single one of those other than high estrogen. Um, so, you know, I talked a lot about my health struggles. I was, you know, my lifestyle was very unhealthy up until, you know, my late twenties. And then I shifted to trying to be healthy. Like I stopped smoking and drinking alcohol and stuff like that. But, you know, I went, I was like raw vegan and then I was vegan for like five years. Um, and then at the age of 35, I stopped being vegan, but I started eating this like pescatarian diet, which it turns out, um, you know, we did an episode on this on the Korean system was like the exact wrong, it was like a low fat pescatarian diet. It was the exact wrong opposite diet that was not good for me. And uh, over time made me feel worse and worse. And unfortunately, you know, as I say, all these warnings I gave earlier are not from a position of superiority, they're from a position of experience because, you know, I rigidly stuck with this diet really without actually anyone shaming me into doing so. I just did it because I'm a rigid person, I guess. You know, <laughs> I'm like, uh, once I decide to do something, I do it 100%. You know, like when I decide to quit smoking, I never spoke again a day in my life. When, you know, uh, ditto with any of the drugs, ditto with anything. Like, um, you know, last few years since I decided to stop having omega-6s, I have not had any. I mean, other than the tiny amounts that are naturally present in, you know, whatever, saturated fats, but... Uh, you know, so I'm I'm very, you know, all in with things. And so I was all in with this diet that didn't work, uh, that wasn't good for me. Um, you know, I had uh, unresolved emotional issues, psychological issues, you know, early life trauma, I think I've talked about before, which I think were a factor. Um, and I had, you know, so I had underlying lead toxicity, which I didn't discover until three years ago. So in terms of what caused you to lose hair, so one of the yeah, as I said, that person, it was a good list. Um, one of the things they didn't say is high DHT. And they they were correct not to include that because I did not have high DHT. I can't be certain if I've ever had it, but my genetics say that I have a tendency to have low DHT genetically. And when I've actually tested my DHT with a blood test, um, it was you know right at the bottom of the reference range. And that reference range itself is way lower these days than it was 30, 40 years ago. So, you know, 30 years ago, I think it would be considered medically low. It was really bad. And that's why I also had quite high anxiety, which is not normal for someone who did have high testosterone. I did. I've tended to always have high testosterone, but I had low DHT. So it's not high DHT. It's not that. So what is it? Well, I am inclined to believe this person who's asked this question, I think is a repeat follower. Um, and I, of all the theories I've heard, I think Danny Roddy, who is a repeat follower, he wrote a book called Hair Like a Fox. And I think, uh, and I, you know, I did read that out of interest. Someone recommended it to me. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about my hair in a second, but I'll carry on with this. Um, and, uh, and I read it with interest. And, you know, his basic conclusion was, yeah, it's, it, it basically it is suboptimal mitochondrial function. It's the same as everything else. It's the same. So back to thyroid, back to metabolism. Uh, partly, but that can also be, um, uh, you know, from Ray Pete's point of view, lack of glucose metabolism, for instance, right? Um, it could be um, oxidative stress. And I think that is a big factor for hair loss uh, at the top of the head specifically. Um so it yeah but yeah thyroid's a big deal absolutely to go back to what you said and then other things that guy mentioned like omega-6 is suppress metabolism right and thyroid function uh estrogen will suppress metabolism and thyroid function uh prolactin will suppress metabolism and thyroid function so that's you know the connection between all of those things that we uh just uh, you know he suggested uh, i think are accurate um but yeah so lead even more than a lot of other more common things, will create high levels of oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, a lack of thyroid will also cause uh, a low metabolism and mitochondrial dysfunction just because of a lack of a rate of uh, turnover of energy production, um, which I've also been diagnosed with. So not only have I been diagnosed with high lead, I've been diagnosed with low thyroid, although that's been better in the last year, but only the last year. And, uh, yeah, I mean, two years ago, it was better than before, but it's really got actually better in the last year. And then, um, uh, sorry, I lost the train of thought then. So the, the, 
the thyroid, the, oh yeah, um, and then cholestasis, so going back to toxic bar theory, for those who are not repeat fans watching, those who are uh, Grand General or Dr. Smith fans, um, I also have a genetic tendency to cholestasis. And so between that, plus the very low choline diet, which could contribute to cholestasis, uh, plus the very low fat diet, which I talked about having, you know, um, for like five years until it became a serious problem. Um, I think between all those factors and a bunch more that I won't go into because that's really enough to create the problem. Um, yeah, I was just generally unhealthy. I was metabolically unhealthy. I was mitochondrial unhealthy. I was not producing enough ATP. And that's why even though on any surface level, I was doing pretty well for a guy my age, right? As I said, you know, when I went into a normal doctor, they kind of treat me like a hypochondriac because they look at all the tests and like, <laughs> you look really healthy for You're your age. You're fine. You're <laughs> fine. You look great. What's, that, what's the problem? <laughs> yeah, other than being underweight and looking a bit tired, I guess those were kind of the signs earlier, like when I met you in my 30s. Um, but you know, nothing really serious and nothing that showed up in any of the kind of tests that they did. But yeah, so, you know, lack of metabolism, lack of mitochondrial function, excess of stress chemicals, cortisol, estrogen, low thyroid, high PUFA, high prolactin. That's definitely been a consistent thing in my, um, in my blood test results. And so now if I talk about my hair for a second, um, I've never cared much about my appearance as you can probably tell, Chrissy, by the lack of effort I put into it all the times that you've seen me. But I've especially never cared about my hair. And in fact, my hair has always kind of been a nuisance to me. Um, my mother kind of always wanted me to have uh, long hair, and I always found it annoying and a nuisance and wished I could cut it. And then basically as soon as I moved out of the house and was able to have control over my own body, I would start cutting my hair short. I also had this tendency in my hair where... Um, at the kind of horns, it would always stick up. And so I'd have to remember every day, and I was not someone who was focused on my appearance. I usually would not even check the mirror before I went out kind of thing. Often I would be out and then someone would say like, you know, your hair's like sticking up. It's like weird horns on the side of it. Oh, that's annoying. And then I would like, so then I'd have to go to a barber or a hairdresser frequently, but half the time they would cut my hair, but they wouldn't resolve that issue. So I'd still have these, I'd have really short hair and then still these weird little horns sticking up on either side. Of, yeah, it's probably the the ha the pattern of like how your hair grows and it's got, yeah. Someone it's... told me it's like sub parietal ridge extension or I don't know what it was, but basically yeah, there's something about it where it would just stick up, like unless the hairdresser cut my hair a certain way. I never liked going to get my hair cut. It was like hair in my face it smelled of chemicals so i'd always avoid it as long as possible even though i didn't like having long hair so i could probably get across like in terms of like my emotional association to my hair it's pretty much a hundred percent negative like there's no you know strolling in my lustrous mane feeling proud of you know getting attention for how slick it is or beautiful it is or anything there was none of that it was always only ever a hassle a nuisance yeah yeah and so when yeah. it's and it started to recede in my mid-20s during that time when i was not healthy at all i really had by the time i started to work in my health i really had a significant widow's peak so it is where it is significantly receding on either side has it got worse since then? And I tried to improve my health, of course, because as I said, a lot of these things like the lead toxicity and the fire and the cholestasis I've really only started addressing in the last year or two. But honestly, it didn't go get that much worse in all of that time since my mid twenties. Like it's gone beyond just a widow's peak to like a bit like, so now I've got like a patch here that is a little bit, but I think part of widow's peak is you normally develop like a ball patch at the back as well. And for whatever reason that hasn't happened to me at all. So the receding is totally still at the front. Um, I And because I just don't care about my hair and it's always been a nuisance to me, uh, at some point I was like, you know, and then you know, I got married and I, I feel, you know, secure in my relationship and I'm like, can I, can I just start shaving my hair off myself? And I don't have to go to a hairdresser and like, and I try and do it with a thing where it's like grade something or whatever and it always doesn't work properly. And I'm like, and eventually I'm like, I'm just gonna throw away these gray things and just do it grade zero, right? Um, that's so typical Owen. <laughs> that's just so you <laughs> <laughs> and then you know if I do it grade zero I don't have to do it for longer right I can get away for longer without having to think about it again exactly um, and yeah. anyway my long you know suffering whatever wife um, she's alright with it basically she's like 
she's like, you know, you look good, bald. She likes me more of a beard, a bit of a beard. So I'm trying to accommodate her in that regard because that's okay. Um, but yeah, she's basically fine with it. So I'm like, thank God. So I <laughs> just shave it off. So um, I realize people judge. I realize people yeah, judge not- you on the stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, so it's not like something that you've ever been super highly focused on. It's, you know, in that regard. But there are a lot of people out there that, that do or have been or, or and still are. It, yeah, and it does matter to some people, I realize. Have I ever tried anything? The one thing I've tried is like using the GHK copper peptide for a while uh, with, um, what's it called? The um, specific type of oil, uh, C60 oil, or oh, ESS60 oil. So that combination I tried. I did like a, and this was really more an experiment because I always do experiments. So I did like a before photo and I did it uh, pretty much every day for six months, didn't do anything. And I realized, you know, I could go to get some kind of hair, whatever, like they they put it back from the back of your head there. And who knows, maybe someone will talk me into it at some point, but people have tried, have not been successful so far. You just cut it. (laughs) (laughs) I realize there's other things that people, you know, people are like, oh, you should put raw egg yolk on it every night and leave it on there. I'm like, oh, I don't want bloody egg on my hair. Are you kidding me? I'm not doing that. Um, and there's like, you know, there's derma roller treatments apparently where like, you know, and then you, you, you kind of, um, what's the word? Microneedling, you kind of, to get the blood flow back there and then you, then you put stuff on there, I guess, like peptides or whatever to try and get it to grow back. But I've not bothered with any of it up until now because, I just don't care. So that's that's the truth. As I say, I'm working with someone at the moment who's like a brand expert and all the rest who's trying to get me into, you know, uh, help me get a much bigger audience because I do want to help more people. If they manage to persuade me that this is a necessary step to do some kind of, you know, natural or maybe even, you know, derma roller or whatever, then maybe I'll do it. But yeah, the number one reason is because I was unhealthy really until recently and number of two reasons is I just don't care. And maybe we can also try and put a image of what I looked like when I still had hair from one of my YouTube videos, and you'll see how bad it used to look, honestly. And maybe that will also help you to understand why I don't, like, why I'm not bothered about going back to those days. Maybe if I had a toupee where it was, like, a really cool hairstyle and I didn't have, like, the silly horns on the other side... Maybe that would work better. But you know what? I don't like having anything on my head. I never wear a no, hat. No, you don't. So I don't think that's going to work either. So I think <laughs> you're just going to have to live with me being bored, guys. Um, yeah. And just accept, But just to go back to that original point, I'm not the personification of health. I'm not the personification of vitality or virility or whatever it might be. And I don't claim to be. You know, All I am is someone who made decent progress, who realized a lot of interesting stuff, who managed to synthesize a lot of stuff and realized that most systems out there are missing stuff. And so I wanted to put a complete system together that wasn't missing anything. And then according to some feedback I get, I'm someone who's pretty good at explaining um, complicated uh, complicated, uh, perspectives in a fairly simple way that an average person who's, you know, already knows a bit about health can understand. And that's why I'm doing this. Um, and I realize I probably would have a lot larger audience already if I went the other way of like pretending to be this image of perfection and and lying about how I got there. And, you know, there's famous cases of that, right? Um, I, yeah, I'll mention him because it's like a published thing, like Liver King, right, who I think got the level of um, notoriety and following he did because he was so impressive looking in terms of his muscular physique. and But he had to pretend that it was natural, right, because – you know, his whole thing was like living like our ancestors do and our ancestors weren't <laughs> injecting themselves with a bunch of different steroids and all the rest of it, right? So uh, I don't want to be one of those people who my brand is based on how I look, honestly. And if that means I limit my growth, then that'll be a shame. And maybe because that maybe one day, as I say, someone will convince me to change my mind. I'm not like drawing a definite line in the sand about it. But that is in a nutshell uh why i am bored and why i'm still bored <laughs> <laughs> but also who, who's to know i mean on your healing journey because you have been in process for quite some time who's to say what may happen in the future i mean who, or whether some will go back or whether it'll just stay where it is and there will be no more future loss because i mean and i don't know near enough about it but it sounds like that's really an internal process you know not anything that necessarily yeah sure okay maybe there's going to be some things that you can do to help support and maybe stimulate, but it really sounds like it's something that needs to come from within. Fundamentally, it is. It's uh, you know a lack of blood. 
blood flow to the area, a lack of fresh nutrients to the area, a lack of you know, mitochondrial and metabol uh, metabolic fitness in general, and usually the extremities suffer. And, and that, you know, that is genetic, you know, like for me, I've never had an issue with, uh, you know, erectile dysfunction or whatever, for some guys they do, you know, I have had an issue of, you know, blood flow to this extremity to the top of my head. And, you know, yeah, fair enough, right? That's, if I had to choose, I'm happy with that, <laughs> ended up in that direction. Um, but um, yeah, uh, so there is a genetic component as to that's why the problem showed up there rather than somewhere else. But, you know, I, I don't deny it is a sign of a problem, right? And it's a it's problems I think I have talked about, you know, publicly and repeatedly. And as I said, I mean, there's a bunch of them, but if I were to boil it down, it's uh, it's lead poisoning, which I still suffer with. It's still higher than 98% of people because it takes a long time to deal with. Um, underactive thyroid, which I'm, you know, pretty good with now. Um, and then cholestasis, which honestly is also still uh, a process that I'm going through. Uh, I don't usually have cholestasis, but I'm still dealing with the level of toxic bile that built up during those years and years and years that I did have cholestasis. So, yeah, still going through the process along with a lot of you and don't claim to be uh, perfect. And I don't think any practitioner I work with needs to be. I'll talk about this with therapists as well for a second. I remember... Um, oh, yeah, please do. So um because that's it's kind of relevant right it's uh, related to the last last part of the rejuvenate blueprint which is you know emotional and psychological causes of health issues and so i remember when i was recommending a therapist to a friend and they were like well you know why would i take health uh, sorry why would i take life advice from someone who's like doing less well than me because it was someone who was you know pretty high performing and i said that's not the point of a therapist the only point of it is someone who listens to you uh, without judgment, with compassion, um, and helps you to get more clarity about what's going inside you and more, you know, acceptance and uh, so insight and, you know, lets you feel like it's, you know, you, you're going to be loved and accepted, it's even, you know, the worst parts of you and stuff like that. And, and, and that's, so if that person has their life together or not, if, if they are, divorced or if their kids are speaking to them or if they are whatever it's actually neither here nor there all that matters is if they are able to serve that function and so I think if you're limiting yourself to you know only people who are already at a pinnacle perfection of when it comes to emotional maturity and healthy relationships and all the rest of it again it depends on what you want them for if you want them as a role model then they they do have to have reached that genuinely but um you know in most cases I'd say I'd say, I know it's really popular, and so this might be a thing to say, but role modeling to me at this stage of my life, it does feel a little bit childish. It feels like going into going into a more infantile state and looking up at someone and like, I want to be like you, you know, where I'd say part of emotional maturity is like, and, and I'm not saying you can't do that of aspects of things. You know, I still look at people and I'm like, oh, I'd like to be able to do this as well as them. And, you know, that's okay. But I, I think that is probably where you want to limit it at. If you're generally looking at someone, because whenever you put someone up on the pedestal, there's there's always this unhealthy dynamic that builds. I, I never had this issue with my therapist. Like, we never really had transference, you know. I never had an issue where, uh, you know, like I had all the stuff that apparently people have with therapists where – you know, you start having all these strong feelings about them and this and that. Like, I never had that. And I think it's because I don't have that tendency to put people on a pedestal. Um, and I and I, I do think that's a good side of, you know, of personality flaws I've talked about. But I do think that's, you know, a side of growth on my part that I don't do that anymore. And I would encourage people not to do that. So you can see qualities in others that you admire and you would want to be more like. That's natural and healthy. But I think... This thing where people go around like idealizing people and wanting to be like them and then inevitably, you know, and how can you tell if you're in this cycle? Do you go through cycles of thinking people are the bee's knees, that they're awesome, and then on the, you know, feeling betrayed, feeling let down, feeling like, you know, they've fallen short, or and then you then you look for the next person to look up to and then and then you go for that cycle over and over again. I see a lot of people doing that, and I think um and i'm not if, if you do that it's just another problem like all my problems i'm not saying it's the end of the world but i'm saying it, i think it's something to be addressed rather than um 
feeling like it's everyone else's fault that they everyone lets you down and they don't live up to your your idealized image of them like no one you know one is ideal and and that's okay and that doesn't mean you can't learn from them and they can't help you and that's why it's not on my list to go back to the original question uh that they are a personification of what you want to achieve yeah, you make a really good point about putting somebody up on a pedestal because eventually, and maybe not all the times, so it depends on where you're at, that they'll come down or fall or then you'll be like, oh, like it's shattered. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. A, no, it's, a, it's a delusion and then followed by disillusion. And it's always very painful. And it's a little bit like the process of falling in love, I guess, like the immature version. Um, it's like a non-romantic you know, version of like falling for someone and then and then there's the inevitable heartbreak as you fall out of love if you realize that they're not perfect after all or they you know whatever they fall short in these ways that you find unacceptable and so it is much better to you know just be to as i say like trying to find that in someone is almost always a sign of a deep psychological wound within you and so i'm not trying to make you wrong if you have that tendency but i'm saying that the resolution is to work with someone to resolve that deep psychological wound not to find the one person who will not let you down which i think is what a lot of people Completely. think is a resolution <laughs> yeah because really and, and and this is another very very important point is that when you do have that person up on the pedestal or at least you can see it or have you know potentially done you know done that myself is that oh gosh what they say i have to do what they say and and like you're giving your power away and then you, when you look back cuz they've fallen off the pedestal then you're like oh god i can't believe i actually did that thing i re i really wish i hadn't i i let their choice their decision override maybe some i was too influenced in a way you know and and so yeah it's 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 a process and i, I like that where it's coming where we, you know you have a skill i'm coming to you for that skill but we're on an even space because then it really keeps you on par with that individual and you, you maintain your power yeah oh and just to acknowledge my own you know imperfections i guess like i haven't had that tendency to put people up on a pedestal as much but i think I've kind of had it, but then, like, I then will spend a lot of time arguing with them because they fall short, like, on an ongoing basis. So I, I don't have the delusion of um, perfection in them, but I do have the delusion or have had the delusion of, you know, if if we have enough, you know, argument, conversation, rational debate, whatever, that eventually you know, I can get this person to conform more to, uh, you know, this ideal. And so it's a kind of different version of it. I, I think it's slightly less dangerous because um, of what you just said, like it does, it, it lacks the quality of unquestionable, uh, unquestioning obedience, but it does, you know, add the quality of um, conflict and friction, which can create its own problems. Um, and so and I think the root of it is probably simpler in either case. It's just kind of different expressions of that. But ultimately... It is about realizing that, you know, if you're an adult, uh, no one is going to give you unconditional love. No one is going to be ideal, you know, an ideal, uh, no, no human being is going to live up to like an idealized parent figure that you wish you had or wish that you have. And, you know, going through that, a lot of it is grief. It's like grieving. Maybe I was never unconditionally loved or maybe I was, but I'm not going to be anymore because I'm an adult now and people expect things of me and, you know, there are certain things that are not that cross a line that mean I don't deserve love anymore. Um, and then, you know, into the ideal stuff, I guess, is obvious, right? People have flaws and and all the rest of it, and we have to accept that. And um, and if you know, if we accept those flaws in others, we can also accept in ourselves. And but anyway, this is more stuff I, I do want to talk about in a future episode. But it's kind of going off topic a little bit. Um, but yeah, the bottom line of um, not expecting perfection from people including in terms of and if they look perfect and healthy they're probably actually not i guess going back to that point so don't be fooled by appearances anyway great i love the deep dive that was really actually good because it does it does help you put things into perspective i mean i remember too is one point 
with this, and this before we move on to the next part, is it's the teachings, not the teacher. And that was what was very evident within my yoga and within my things like that, is that the teacher is there passing on the teachings, yet that teacher still is a, is a human being living a, a, a human experience and infallible and, and you know on their own journey as well. Now, if they are arrogant about it and a complete hypocrite and all the rest of it, that needs to be addressed and maybe that's not the right teacher you know that's the similar to the qualities that we've just given here for a practitioner for instance uh, but yeah if they can approach that lack of um, perfection with humility and honesty as you say then you know, that person may well still be worth listening to. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. So now going back, bringing it full circle. So we started the episode really looking about how to find the right practitioner. So within the rejuvenation blueprint, then how would somebody go about that? Finding the right practitioner for each of the seven steps that you have. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll keep this pretty quick because, you know, there's a lot of overlap. But okay, so obviously, the first thing that we want to look at is genetics. Um, in an ideal world, you don't actually need a practitioner for that. And part of what we're looking to do, and I'm continually trying to expand it on the, um, uh, the YouTube channel, especially currently, but you know, also the podcast is to provide all the resources necessary so that people have all the guidance they need to go through their genetic results themselves, whether they're using our system or you know, a comparable, similar one, perhaps. Um, if you do want to work with a practitioner to kind of walk you through, uh, I would humbly offer myself as a potential if it is my system you're using. Um, of course, if it is not, um, then you know, I would look to someone who has plenty of understanding of genetics and plenty of experience um, ideally to actually walk you through it, all the qualities we've uh, talked about before. Um, and being, I think this is the most general of all the seven categories because there is no such thing as a credential or a qualification for like a genetic walkthrough specialist, right? It doesn't really exist. Now, obviously, there are other professions that that is part of what they do. But again, in terms of, um, you know, for me, that's primarily what I do, right? So it's back to that thing of expertise. I don't have a qualification in it, but it is the main thing that I do with people. And so I would encourage that, you know, in terms of genetics, ideally, that's someone you find, that it's the main thing that they do with people as opposed to a side gig. Because my experience is even very highly qualified people I've looked at who are the vast majority of them have very little understanding of the genetics aspect. That's not knocking anyone. There's many different things that they are great at. It's just that they're not specialists in genetics, you know? So I look for someone who is. Unfortunately, as I say, there is no category for that right now. So that that's, this is the only one where I'm going <laughs> to volunteer myself <laughs> as an example. Of... And so, Elwyn, just real quick, if somebody did want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you on that? So I only work with people um, who are actually Genetic Insights customers. So I limit it to that because, as I said, that's all I, you know, that's really all that's in my remit to do with them. Um, if you are a Genetic Insights customer, then you'll get like follow-up emails that um, is not pushed aggressively at all. I've had some people saying I should push it more aggressively, but somewhere in those emails, you'll find a link that you can book a consultation with me. Um, so the next one, uh, the next category would be deficiencies, right? And so uh, as I've said before in this podcast and sometimes other people's, I am continually amazed how often, although it's certainly not guaranteed, but how frequently just resolving an underlying deficiency makes a massive difference in people's lives. And of course, we do have one video interview I put up where someone was uh, happy to you know, share about that publicly. That I, You can find that on the YouTube channel. 
Um, but yeah, it can make a massive difference. Um, now, even with that one, I noticed some people missed the point. They were like trying to copy and do the same thing that that client was doing. And I said, that's not the point. The point is to find the thing that you are the most you know in need of and then to provide it for yourself and so and yeah so your go for your genetics will give you a starting place for that right it'll tell you these are the nutrients that you might need more of so that's excellent now if they are nutrients that are harmless to take in large quantities like say vitamin b12 then you could just go ahead and buy that and see if that helps even something like vitamin b12 though it's funny you can buy a supplement easily that's like a thousand times the recommended daily amount but sometimes, ironically, even when you buy that supplement, it's not enough. And you actually need more than that. So even with something like that, it's still better to work with a practitioner. And certainly, if we're talking about something that it's easy to overdo as well as underdo, like copper, zinc, iron, potassium, vitamin D3, um, certainly vitamin A, for reasons we talked about, uh, even you know vitamin B6, all of these kind of things. Um, it is better to make sure that you actually need it. And so I would recommend that you test, uh, but depending on where you are, it may not even be possible to do your own test. You might have to have a practitioner order it for you. And even if you don't have to have a practitioner order it for you, in order to really interpret those tests, even the most user-friendly ones, like you know we recommend Nutraval here by Genova Diagnostics, and they do their best to make it as user-friendly for the end user as possible, even though you are supposed to order it through a practitioner. But still, there's like a, what, a 200-page book that goes with it to like help you to interpret the results, Chrissy? Yeah, it's pretty much, it's a very, very detailed booklet. And also, too, depending on which company you order that through, like sometimes they'll allow you for an extra add-on price, have a practitioner walk you through the results. But but Genova do a really great job of just, you, which you don't have to do that, but if you, um, with that booklet, then there's a lot of education out there for you to do it. And Nutrivel is extremely beneficial when you're looking at your health yes so you know there are a lot of um practitioners out there if i was focused on nutrition i would probably go for someone who is a nutritionist or a functional medicine doctor those would be the two i'd go for based on my experience if you disagree and you want to suggest you think someone else would be better then feel free to put it in there uh notice i did not say dietitian dietitians are really giving mainstream health advice uh, first of all, they're not usually testing as broadly as what we would recommend. And second of all, they are not focused on optimization uh, as much as I would recommend. And third of all, they are heavily mainstream in their perspective as to what constitute health. So they are likely to recommend things like soy and vegetable oils and all that kind of stuff that probably listeners of this podcast know is not a good idea. Um, and also things that you may decide you don't want to do, like lots of fiber and you know vegetables and all that kind of stuff. So um, I would recommend a nutritionist or a functional medicine person. What kind? Well, obviously one who you know <laughs> fits into all the criteria I said earlier, and ideally you know one that understands a lot of the stuff that we talk about here and is I uh, is um, um, open to you know the uh, genetic reports which you share with them. But you know the most important thing is that. There's someone who's focused on optimization rather than just fixing problems. And there's someone who doesn't just give you a one size fits all thing, but actually tests to see what you do and don't need. Beautiful. And as you said, you know, and that's why we're doing this episode, really looking at those qualities as you're finding that person, as you're finding those lists and, and you know, that, so that you can find that individual that's on the same page as you so that you know and feel fully supported in, in your process as you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So, um, What's next, Owen? So next, uh, excesses. Um, again, I would say probably a functional medicine practitioner, from my experience. They are the ones that are going to be most competent with that. Naturopaths as well. And again, what matters really is the individual, not the school. So that's why you know I said expertise is matter. So it, uh, finding someone who gets everything that we talk about here in this podcast and more in the realm that you want help with is always the most important criteria. But just to give you a starting place, I would say a functional medicine practitioner, probably more than anyone else. Naturopath, sometimes, but they tend to do less testing and more kind of one size fits all in my experience. Yeah, I was uh, gonna ask the distinction right there of where you were trying to choose one over the other and what the criteria would be. Naturopath is more, oh God, I don't wanna upset anyone, but um, 
Functional medicine are much more into testing. Let's just put it that way. Um, naturopath is more like tried and true kind of universal advice. Um, like for instance, naturopaths, if you're talking about detox, they're almost always going to recommend you to have like, uh, uh, you know, herbal bitters to help the flow of bile to prevent cholestasis. It's not bad advice, but I would prefer to, you know, narrow down what's causing the cholestasis in the first place. Herbal bitters don't agree with everyone, you know. But again, as I said, these are very broad generalizations. Obviously, you can find naturopaths who are great and you can find functional medicine people who are clueless. Um, but I would probably, all things being equal, start with probably a functional medicine or maybe like a naturopath or a nutritionist. Sometimes they also understand about toxicity in a reasonable amount of depth as well. So those would probably be the categories I go to. Notice I didn't say medical doctor with either of those. They are usually clueless on both of these categories. Of course, if the person is a functional medicine doctor and a medical doctor, like Dr. Miriam, who's our most frequently um, uh, featured uh, practitioner on this podcast, then fantastic, right? That's best of both worlds. But generally, if they are only a medical doctor, they probably don't know much about... Uh, again, they'll know about life-threatening poisonings, but they will not know about long-term chronic uh, toxicities or you know just suboptimal levels of detoxification function. They're just not focused on that. Okay. And so, yeah, good distinctions. And that's also questions that they can ask. Where do you have ex certain experiences? If you think something is going to be, or if you figured out that your, um, your issue is excesses, you know, ask those questions, figure out and, and see what they say and what they come back with. And if you're happy with those answers. Yeah. And in terms of functional medicine practitioners, I, I think there's kind of a trend these days in the functional medicine world to focus a lot on mycotoxins, which are the mold toxins. Um, so I guess, if you meet a practitioner and they're like, that's definitely the case for you. I mean, they may be right, but, <laughs> um, you know, make sure that they're one who is thinking broadly, I guess. Um, uh, like, oh, it could also be this. It could all be, so be this. You know, I had a practitioner who assumed that was a problem with me and I had to kind of work out for myself that it was actually a heavy metal thing because uh, they didn't, you know, it didn't occur to them to do a blood test for that. Um, and... You know, there's a there's a handful of things. There's Lyme's disease. Um, you know, there's a few things like that which often are at the root of these when nothing seems to work and people have chronic systemic inflammation where they kind of react to everything. Heavy metals is one. Mycotoxins is another. Lyme's is another. Uh, there's probably one more I'm forgetting, but there's not many. So these are kind of like the things that usually are, there's the first port of call for these practitioners. Um, but it's good, if possible, to have someone who also will test, you know, how well you detoxifying in general with some of the markers we talked about before in those kind of episodes. And, um, you know, who's not only focused on their pet thing, whatever that may be. Okay. And then, um, so yeah, we've gone through the deficiencies and the excesses. Is there anything else that you want to um, support everybody with and how to find the right practitioner? Uh, no, let's go on to the next one. So uh, for, for imbalances, you know, I'm using, uh, sometimes they call this cell signaling agents, but, you know, we're really talking about hormones, uh, neurotransmitters and peptides primarily, probably hormones more than anything, uh, because they have such a massive impact on the function of your body, but also how you feel in the moment. So it's a way of helping people to feel a lot better very quickly, which is super important because I know everyone has a different perspective in this. And so this is why I want to, you know, share the right kind of practitioner for this. I would say actually probably the best kind of practitioner for this one probably is a medical doctor, but it's a medical doctor who specializes in optimization. The reason I say that is because, okay, so if it's a medical doctor who doesn't specialize in optimization, as I talked about earlier and many times, they're only going to be interested once you're ready very, very unwell, right? So that's not helpful. But I've seen a lot of like, and this is definitely not universal, but there's a lot of functional medicine practitioners, naturopaths, nutritionists, all these kind of all, you know, slightly alternative paths who are quite reluctant, even if they, and now it depends on the country. In the UK, the only one who can prescribe bioidentical hormones like progesterone um, are medical doctors. But in the US and a lot of other countries, some other practitioners are able to, um, but they are often reluctant to. And I think it's for various reasons. It might be partly practical because it's a risk, you know, with license wise and the rest of it. But it's definitely also partly ideological. Like they want to do their best to get the person healthy with quote unquote natural methods first. Um, and if 
that is your perspective too, then you would be better off going for some of those practitioners. Because if you go to a medical doctor, even a really great one, they're going to say, well, why would we mess around with all that? Let's just help you feel better. So that, you know, I guess it depends partly what you're looking for. Um, you know, I take this case by case. Um, when it comes to something like, you know, thyroid or um, let's say, you know, progesterone in women, I say just give some help, right? They're both bioidentical natural products. Thyroid comes from an animal gland. Bioidentical progesterone comes from wild yam. They're both very, very, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Safe. It, when it comes to other things like, um, you know, in insulin or testosterone, I am a bit more cautious. You know, I don't necessarily want to just um, replace it with an exogenous hormone. I would want to support the person in optimizing their own levels if possible first. So this is a little bit case by case, even we're in the realms of uh, hormones. Um, so yeah, I guess those are your choices, right? If, if you want to just feel better quickly, um, and there's nothing wrong with that from my perspective. Some people are at the brink of overwhelm and giving up. Some people are at the brink of despair. Some people are at the brink of homelessness. You know, like you can't always afford in many different senses to be sp being a Puritan and going the long way because it's more natural. Sometimes you just have to feel better. And remember, a lot of people who are like, they want to do the natural way, but they're already keeping themselves going with this cocktail of drugs usually, right? They've got stimulants to get them out of the house and then they've got you know, depressants to help them relax at the end of the day and they're taking sleeping aids to help them sleep and you know they're taking painkillers every time they get an ache and pain and a headache and all the rest of it. Like, so these people are already on a cocktail of unnatural substances to keep them functioning, but then they balk at the idea of using a purely natural bioidentical something which would actually resolve the root of the problem and make them not need or need far less of all these other exogenous um, influences. So I do think people get this asked backwards a lot of the time, honestly. Um, but, you know, I, I respect a Puritan who's a genuine Puritan, as I say, who's not on this cocktail of all kinds of things. And I do come across them. And so, yeah, it, you know, natural science, for instance, that's like a philosophy where it's all extremely do it pure not you know they're even against like oil because it's an extract you know <laughs> rather than being natural that kind of stuff so if you're more in that puritan kind of a train of thought then and and you live that and you can get away with it then fantastic you're probably better off when it comes to this stuff going to uh like i say like a functional medicine and naturopath maybe even you know um more working on emotions and psychology and stuff like that like step seven because they will have an impact, you know, meditation has an impact on your hormones, uh, fixing your circadian sleep rhythm will have an impact on your hormones, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, maybe you'd be more, you know, you do better with uh, focusing all that stuff first. So it depends partly on where you're coming from. But if you just want to feel better as soon as possible, uh, I would go for a medical doctor in most cases, but specify it's one who focuses on optimization. How do you know that? Um, if you're like Googling for one in your area, if you put like, bio, depending on what it is, if it's sex hormones, then like putting in bioidentical hormones often is helpful. If it's thyroid hormone, then I would usually like search for NDT, which stands for natural desiccated thyroid. That helps you find uh, something. So, you know, those are good starting places. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I love that little point there too. It's like you're looking for that doctor that's looking for optimization and, and we're focusing there. All right. So we've done one through four. How about step five? We're really looking at lifestyle things here. Yeah. So this is the one that I guess maybe people are least likely to go to a practitioner for, and that's potentially completely valid, you know? Um, the changes like optimizing your sleep schedule and circadian rhythm, like we talked about, changes like reducing your stress, changes like um, uh, changing your you know light exposure, like we talked about in a recent episode, changes like uh, optimizing your movement throughout the day or your exercise regime, all of that kind of stuff can be done. So it kind of depends a little bit on what it is, you know, if it's exercise. Um, then you may want to work with a trainer. But again, you've got to be careful of what kind of trainer you go for. Um, and you want to, you know, a lot of people who go to trainers, they just want to, you know, usually lose weight or get muscles. And so that's generally where, or both, and that's generally where they're going to be focused. And so 
you would make sure you want to make sure you work with a trainer who's not going to push you as hard as possible you want to make sure you work with a trainer who's like looking again to optimize you right and i don't know if there is a specific type of trainer that's like that that has a specific name if you do then feel free to add it to the comments but that would be you know the criteria i'm looking for you have to make it clear i'm looking for someone to support me in being as healthy as optimized as possible not someone to push me as hard as possible, right? Well, that's exactly it. It's such a good point because especially if somebody's having the underactive thyroid or if they're struggling there in certain things, but yet they're having to do hit cardio like three, four times a week because that's what the trainer's, you know, prescribing or, you know, suggesting, like, eh, not such a great fit. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of other stuff, I, I'd say, you know, it falls more in the realm of a coach than anything, right? Because this is often lifestyle stuff that is, common sense-ish that we know we should do, but we just don't do it, and so why not? And a lot of the time it's because we don't have any support, right? Maybe everyone else in our lives, if we tell them I'm gonna start going to bed earlier, I'm gonna start you know, getting up and going for a, a, a walk or a run first thing or whatever, like they, or I, you know, if you say I'm gonna try and drink less alcohol in the evenings or whatever it might be. Unfortunately, often the people around us, it's a bit of a crab in the bucket thing. They are trying to drag us down, they're trying to drag us back to, you know, our old habits just because they are uh, f familiar to them and it makes them feel more comfortable, not because then, you know, innately necessarily trying to sabotage you or hurt you. And so having a coach, someone on your side who is like, you know, motivational and inspiring and supportive and all the rest of it um, may be, you know, the most helpful thing there. And in terms of how to find a coach, it's really the same thing, right? Looking for all those criteria that we talked about earlier. Fantastic. All right. Now moving into step six, pathogens. Yeah. So uh, this is a tricky one. And so this uh, a little bit similar, like with the hormones, it depends on the jurisdiction that you're in to some degree, and it depends on your own personal proclivities. So the ideal when it comes to chronic infections or pathogens is to, you know, there's the, the whole terrain versus, um, you know, infection model, like what uh, Pasteur versus Bouchamp is is the cause of disease the organism or is it the terrain that they exist within and you know simple resolution hardly a surprise if you know me well it's always both right not one or the other and so when it comes to chronic health conditions so acute conditions usually are emergencies and they have to be dealt with by a medical professional I'm not talking about that when it comes to pathogens. But if we're talking about chronic infections, you know, maybe, you know, sinus infections, recurring urinary tract infections, digestive infections, SIBO, all that kind of stuff, people often have had it off and on for years. It's not, you know, usually an emergency, it's unlikely to turn into an emergency. So then there is a bit of a question of, you know, do I want to just try and deal with it straight away or do I want to address the root causes? I, I'm on the opposite side of this than I am with hormones. With hormones, because it makes such a big difference to how you feel, you know, especially with some of them, like I said, like progesterone for women beyond a certain age is so incredibly helpful. I'm largely a fan of just using it. Um, but when it comes to chronic infections, if you don't deal with the underlying cause as to why it's there, there's such a high reoccurrence rate that I am actually more of a fan of trying to address the terrain to some degree first. So, you know, increasing your metabolism, for instance, will make a massive difference to how well your immune system is functioning dealing with any chronic infections, dealing with any you know, toxicities, because when, when your immune system has to deal with a certain excessive level of toxicity, it's then not capable of dealing with the infection. And even if you get rid of the infection with aggressive antibiotics or anti-whatevers, it's quite likely to just come back again because the immune system still is dealing with this toxin. So this is a little bit case by case. And I would say the kind of practitioner who's probably best equipped to uh, address this again, in my experience, would be a functional medicine person with one caveat. Generally, the functional medicine system, as much as I like it, obviously it's the type I've recommended the most often, um, like the first step they focus on is removing. That's technically they have the five R's and the first one is remove, which is keep, you know getting rid of these organisms. Now, admittedly, they usually... You know, like to start doing it with natural things like mastic gum or garlic or uh, oregano or grapeseed extract or whatever. But still, I think that this is incorrect. Um, and if you're working with an open mind, because, because of what I just said, right, the chances of it recurring and the harshness on the body, 
of taking these things. Even yes, the natural things are often very harsh. Um, and so I would, um, I would encourage working either with a functional medicine practitioner who understands what I just said and who does want to work on some of the other stuff, the, the you know, looking at the genetic basis, the nutrients, the um, toxins, the hormones, and maybe even lifestyle factors before they start addressing the chronic infections. Again, assuming that they're not, you know, ext extreme. Or if that person is hard to find, then maybe just make sure you are working with someone to deal with some of the other stuff and then start on the functional medicine path if that practitioner is like, uh, what's the word? If they are fairly, if they're sticking close to the script and the script is technically that they should be doing that removes step first. Um, I would say, you know, Dr. Miriam, who we've had on, who's both a medical practitioner and a functional medicine practitioner. Uh, my experience of her is she definitely doesn't get people to do that remove first. Um, you know, she doesn't always put as much emphasis on, uh, um, what's the word, like the genetics and the nutrients as I would, which is why we make a good team. I often do that first to people and then I hand them over to her for the next steps. Um, but yeah, she, uh, you know, definitely will not just get people on that remove step. And to be fair, there are plenty of other functional medicine practitioners who do veer from the kind of prescribed course a bit and do look at other stuff first. But yeah, this is why I put it as like the sixth thing I would focus on and not the first as it is in that functional medicine system. Um, but every case is different. And in some cases, working on this first may well be the best thing to do. Um, so yeah, so yeah I, 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 sorry to just finish. I'd go for functional medicine and not like a gastroenterologist or an ear, nose and throat doctor or whatever it might be initially. Um, because again, those people are often more focused on acute issues, not chronic issues. And they are more focused on resolving severe issues, not optimization. And a lot of the time, you know, if you have issues with, you know, like SIBO or LIBO or something like that, like the symptoms are often very disparate and diffuse, you know, it's like fatigue and it's skin, it's this and that. And doctors tend to hate it when you have a bunch of, you know, seemingly unconnected, uh, diffuse symptoms that are, you know, obviously if you have stamming pain in your abdomen or something, then they're likely to work with you. But if it's, if it's much less obvious than that, then they're often less helpful. And so, you know, potentially a functional medicine practitioner will be more likely to be helpful in that case. Having said that, I just want to go back and say, I always recommend going to a medical practitioner first. And I don't just say that from a perspective of legal liability. In fact, not primarily, I mean it. And it's also what I do too. Uh, it's what I do with myself, with my loved ones, and what I would even, you know, we're going to do a pet episode soon. It's, you know, it's even what I do with my pets. I take them to a vet first. But it's just that then if the doctor, the vet, whatever, um, is like not, you know, helpful for all the usual reasons, because it's not far gone enough, because, you know, the symptoms are too d diverse, it's not extreme enough, whatever, they're not focused on optimization, then... I would do all the other stuff. So I just want to give that caveat, you know. I didn't kind of mention that with, say, nutrition stuff because we know that a doctor is not going to focus on that unless it's basically iron, B12, folate, or maybe D3. So, you know, but, yeah, certainly with these issues like infections, that is something that doctors do absolutely focus on and care about. And so uh, I would go to a medical doctor first in most cases. So, all this advice is always assuming you've already done that and they haven't been able to help because unfortunately that is very common with uh, these chronic issues. Yeah, well said. It's as too, it's like it's that first point of call as well because, you know, depending, maybe that doctor, you might be quite surprised and they might be like, oh no, they have a passion for all of this and, and they're, they're a, bright, a wider scope than maybe what you went have first initially realized or you then suddenly go, absolutely not going to do that. I'm going to go find somebody else. So, but definitely check first. Definitely check first. So the final step, step seven, the emotions and mindset. Yes, this one's the broadest, but I'll try and narrow it down. Like, there's a lot of different people you could see for this, honestly, um, all of which could be helpful from my experience. But I'll try and narrow it down to three categories of uh, practitioner. So I'd say the first would be one who uh, taught kind of positive facing emotional stuff. And so that might be like a meditation teacher, a spiritual guru, maybe, um, uh, you know, like a Tony Robbins type coach, you know, to help you feel motivated, NLP practitioner, any of those kind of people who basically, and I know that those 
are very different practitioners in a lot of different ways, but the one thing they all have in common is kind of a focus on the positive in one way or another. I guess meditation is focusing on stillness, but stillness is pretty positive to me. So they're all kind of practitioners who focus on the positive. So any style of practitioner who focuses on the positive in a way that you find, um, you know, they, they fit the other criteria we've talked about before, and it's a way that you find palatable, you know, like you, you, some of you are more, you know, you want to hear chanting and spiritual mantras. Some of you are more, you want to hear, you know, hyped up motivational stuff in the language you recognize. You know, some of you are more, you want stillness and whatever, right? And I'm sure there's others, just what pops into my head. So any of that stuff's great and whatever style suits you, like a positive focused practitioner who fits all the other criteria, great. Second category um, especially if you have a lot of unresolved trauma and a lot of unresolved emotions even didn't necessarily have to have had trauma but let's say you know you had upbringing where you you were made to feel like your your feelings didn't matter or like your feelings had to be suppressed or things like that then those unacknowledged invalidated feelings can ruin your life and i know this is a bit of a controversial thing to say in one sense these days because it's true we are seeing in the younger generations now, younger than me and Chrissy, that by like having too much focus on their feelings and too much focus on validating their feelings, um, it does create a different issue uh, of you know being maybe spoiled, maybe overly delicate, lacking emotional resilience and toughness. But I don't. My opinion on that, and I'm willing to change my mind, but my opinion on that is that. That's not genuinely coming from a place largely of over-validation and like too much love and too much. I think still the epidemic I see with the younger generations is that they've been kind of ignored because there's so many pulls on our attention because these days both parents often work or are busy, whereas in the past you know, it was more likely at least one parent was not working up until, you know, relatively recently, a few generations ago, maybe a bit before us, Chrissy, but still not that long. So we're, we're more likely to have parents who are not paying attention to us. We're more likely to have parents who are distracted because of, you know, in the past TVs, but these days iPhones, social medias and the rest, and not truly genuinely present with us. Um, and we're more likely to have... Um, you know, uh, like the access to so much input at all times, I think has really fried kids' brains. Um, you know, the I remember back in the day uh, being like upset if I missed a TV show because it was only one once and it was never going to be on again or it might be years until it came on again. It was such a big deal to miss it, you know. So that was my trauma. But these days there's the trauma of like, you know, you can watch beheading videos and horrific sexual things and all like at the touch of a button on your phone at all times or, and you know, on a philosophical level, you can get access to, you know, Nietzsche and learn why life is meaningless and, you know, God is dead and all kinds of like stuff that is really quite, you know, problematic, let's just say, for people. And I think that's really more the issue of the younger generation i don't think I, I think maybe the you know everyone gets a trophy uh is not great you know like there's no competition anymore and and that kind of stuff and i'm not like totally against the people who say that you know kids are some degree maybe spoiled but i think it's more that they're actually more traumatized and more ignored anyways and then when the parents do focus on them it's often not genuine it's kind of performative um is what i see yeah, I I'll take it also back to, you know, when we were discussing the different states, the, I'm going to get them wrong. So you'll have to correct me, the ventral vagal, dorsal vagal, yep. and you know, that, you know, all of that yeah, and and with all, it. yeah, with, with all of that input that they are exposed to from such a young age, the, the toll it is taking on their biochemistry and on everything like that, that they may also just be in that, um, 
hibernation state where they're just like, uh, they just don't have it anymore. They don't have the next step to go to. There's anxiety is prolific in the very young generation now. Like a lot yeah, of kids that Because of you know, constant talk. sympathetic stimulation. You're right. And that, that, that is the primary thing more than anything else. I just, I kind of wanted to bring the parenting aspects as well, but I agree that I think that is the primary thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I sure. guess the point is the parents also have that. That's my point. Yes. And the parents yes, are constantly yes, yes, being yes. distracted by that. And then to kind of – because parents these days are, you know, less abusive overall, less physically abusive overall, and more interested in their children's lives overall and all the rest of it. But because they're in such a high sympathetic state from everything, like th this is why I said the the interest in the child, children's life is more performative because what, it, what would really be the most beneficial is if the parent is – you know, relaxed and present with the child. And I think as much as, you know, we've had world wars and all the rest of it, and I realise it's never been smooth sailing, but still I think life used to be most of the time so much more boring for most people. Most of the time there just wasn't much stimulation. And within that boredom, there was a lot of more calmness and stillness uh, between, you know, with parent and with child. And, that you know, Within that stillness and boredom, then children were able to be more imaginative and more genuinely playful and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, I don't know why I went on that long. Oh, yeah, just to say, yeah, I realized that depending on your generation, your trauma might be quite different um, or your issues might be quite different. But still, like we all have this stuff to to resolve and work out. And I think um, working with someone who can... And it doesn't have to be a therapist. It could be a, a priest. It could be, you know, some kind of spiritual person, as I said. But someone who is uh, compassionate but detached, uh, who is objective, um, who you can feel that they care, who actually, you know, I like what we said before about the practitioners, when it comes to this stuff, that is super important, that they are, you know, they actually have compassion and empathy. Um, and that actually... Um, um, yeah, that you can feel that they care. Oh, sorry, and actually listens. Yeah, that's the most important aspect because, you know, if you've had a good upbringing, you may well have had a bunch of people around who genuinely care about you, but you may still not have really been listened to and heard because, as I said, everyone's so distracted and everyone's so overstimulated. Um, you know, it can be very beneficial and very uh, healing for most people. And as I said, uh, you know, therapy is a relatively recent invention, but I think before that, that role was taken on by... Um, to some degree, priests, priestesses, whatever, and to some degree, uh, grand or great grandparents because they didn't have a lot to do anymore and they were much more objective because they lived a long, you know, life and they'd actually managed to accrue some wisdom, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, maybe, yeah, before there were priests, maybe there were shamans or whatever. But, you know, I think throughout our history, there has been someone to fulfill that role of being the more objective, maybe a little bit closer to, hmm, a spirit realm or something, but basically not as as in the thick of it of everyday life, I guess, is kind of more the point. Uh, whether it's a shaman who's, you know, take, using plants to <laughs> be outside of the everyday world or whether it's a priest who's, you know, supposed to be praying hours a day to be outside of the everyday world and kind of lives this cloistered life where they don't have to worry about, you know, the rat race and all the rest of it. Or whether it's, as I say, grandparents who have already done all that now and now they can kind of more be contemplating what's next, you know, after they die, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's very helpful to have the perspective of that person, but even more in person, important to have that person listen to you, have compassion for you, um, and be truly present for you. You know, the presence thing is very hard to, under, like, explain or quantify in a rational scientific sense but someone who's actually present um with you can be immensely healing for people in a way that's really hard to uh explain or understand from a rational point of view but it's true it's very true uh, you you know sorry i was just thinking about the gravity of that of somebody really showing up for you and you knowing that that person is there 100% just for you is it's just yeah I was like oh yeah it's so true it's just got a little emotional thinking of because it's a massive thing it's a massive thing and many people don't feel, may not feel that they have that they never at get all. it and it doesn't mean your wife or husband or whoever you know doesn't love you that they don't do that it just means they're in their own thing right as I said this is I think this traditionally was always the role of people who are somewhat outside society 
either, either through role, like a priest or a shaman or whatever, or through uh, age, right? Like they've already done all that and they're kind of a little bit beyond it. Um, and then, yeah, the third category of practitioner that I would um, recommend so trauma and upset and emotions do not only exist in some abstract realm. They also exist in the body very much. And usually, especially the mechanism by which we repress and suppress how we feel, which we often have to, you know, imagine if your boss comes in and starts shouting, you haven't done something and you start crying in front of them. I mean, yeah, again, maybe this younger generation, that's okay. But I think certainly for our generation, that wasn't acceptable, right, Chrissy? Um, and also, Crying isn't acceptable and shouting back at them also isn't acceptable, right? Like, so many times we just have to suppress our feelings. It is life. But the problem is the more we do it, the more that builds up these chronic patterns of tension in our body, which ultimately are extremely undermining to health. And so my experience is, it's funny, I just had a client recently who, again, no personal details, but they're someone who had a severely traumatic background and they had tried their best so much with so many different types of therapies and it had not worked at all, at all. Like, and they tried their best. And when I say it didn't work at all, like n no feelings come up up to the surface. No um, memories come up, no shifts in behavior and, you know, stuff that actually matters um, as a result of it that were, you know, significant. And and I said, have you ever done a body-based therapy? I said, no. And as I, I mean, uh, I think they've done EMDR, which I guess is body based, it's, but it's only eye movements. It's it's one. It it is body based, but it's one tiny facet only, unfortunately. Um, and so I, you know, I recommend some body based ones, and I've talked about this before. Uh, for me, this was necessary. You know, um, I could have spent the rest of my life just talking to someone about how I feel and having interesting conversations, but again, basically getting nowhere because those feelings are so suppressed by these chronic patterns of tension and. The more, more traumatized you are, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to have had dramatic stories that people go ooh and ah about. It just means, you know, that it's had a big impact on you. But the more that, you know, trauma has made an impact on you, um, the more likely it is that only talk or gentle things are not going to be enough. And you need something to really break through that, what Wilhelm Wright called uh, muscular armoring. And in fact, the, the bigger and stronger and more muscular you are as well, unfortunately, the harder it is to help you because that big, those big, strong muscles actually keep you even more emotionally Solidified. suppressed. Right. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. yeah, there's, I mean, I, I've always, you know, seen books and read things out there, but always believe that the body is the subconscious mind. It's just trying to tell you everything. It, it is there and that the emotions are stored within. And as... And this is what I've always tried to express to, to the kids, family, is it's great to talk about it, but now you have to move the energy from within. So, you know, you're be, it's that beginning process. And then also, too, now we need to release. And so, unfortunately, all the practitioners I know with these are not super common. But um, you know, my favorite is Alexander Lowen's Bioenergetics and Wilhelm Reich's system. It doesn't really have its own separate name. These are both like working very intensely with the body um, until you have a kind of uh, a breakthrough. Uh, there are some practitioners and there's people who do, you know, they'll do it via Skype. If they're far away, there are people who will, you know, who run retreats you can go to for a weekend, week, all that kind of stuff, evening. So that's a possibility perhaps. Um, other systems I like, um, the Hana Somatics, uh, again, there's a network of practitioners. They're not like in every town or anything, but you might be able to find. I, I happen to find one within 20 minutes driving distance of me when I was into it. So, you know, that's it, even though I live in the middle of nowhere in England, so that's possible. Um, and then also counter strain. Uh, that's one. There was literally only one practitioner in the UK, but there are a bunch of them in the US, for instance, like quite a few. And I think growing because Tony Robbins recommended it a while ago. And so it's become more popular since then. Um, and what all those systems have in common, and the reason I recommend them, is because they are going with the flow of um, helping the brain basically become aware of this chronic um, tension that it uses to repress emotion, and then showing it repeatedly how to stop holding that tension, not by stopping, but actually by increasing it. That's what all those three very different systems have in common. They're like, find an area where it's tense, uh, where there is tension, where there is 
you know, a lack of movement and then make it more tense until you are very, very aware of how tense it is. <laughs> That's basically, you know, all those systems in a nutshell. And so, you know, the different, I'd say counter strain is the most gentle of the three. The uh, bioenergetics Riken was the most intense, uh, but they all have that thing in common. If there's any other systems out there that, you know, work on the same principles you'd like to tell me about, please do in the comments. I'm certainly interested in it, but that's what I found actually works. Unfortunately, if you're holding tension to tell your body to relax, which is the more common approach of, you know, physical therapist and osteopaths and chiropractors and all the rest of it, they're, they're kind of always trying to put it in a relaxed posture or get you to put it in a relaxed posture. But it's a thing you have to keep doing. Whereas if you do the opposite, if you actually show the brain how tense it's being by making it more tense, it leads to shifts, you know, a lot more quickly and a lot more effectively. So... You would think it sounds counterintuitive that you're just like, no, just relax, just let go. But actually, yeah, it kind of makes sense because it's like, hey, you're doing that thing. Oh, I'm doing that thing. Oh, yeah, okay. And then stop doing that thing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagine someone ways. walks around scowling all the time, right? And you're like, this isn't really helping you to make friends. And then so you keep saying to the person every time, like, smile, smile. And the person's like, so they're scowling. You're like, huh? Okay. Like, that could have some degree of helpfulness. The person might feel oh, they're trying. But instead, if you go, look in the mirror, you're scowling. They go, oh, wow. And they go, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you see how that's a lot more effective treatment yeah. than just to keep reminding yourself to smile is to actually remind yourself, oh, look, I'm scowling again. It, you know, it's a more direct and quicker. So that's, yeah, that's an illustration of how it works in a nutshell. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of our practitioners. I know that was the longest for that one because there's such a broad selection of different people and I kind of had to explain the last category. Um, but I think that's it. No, it's brilliant. This has been excellent, Owen. It's, you know, I don't think I've ever seen much out there on really like, hey, how to go find the right practitioner for you. So this is really helpful because I don't think a lot of people take it into consideration or realize, oh, actually I can interview somebody. I can decide who I want to work with and, oh, here's my criteria to do it. So this is, uh, in, I've found it extremely helpful and, and I believe our listeners will too. So thank you for that. Before we close, are there any final thoughts that you want to share? Yeah, just to address your point there, uh, you know, I realize unless it's all free, every practitioner you see you have to pay for. And so I can see from that point of view, it's very tempting to just go for the first one that seems you know, competent or half decent or nice or whatever your criteria are. But I would encourage you to just think, you know, if you're going to be working with that person medium to long term, how important it is and also how much money it could waste or time it could waste if you pick the wrong person. So uh, picking a practitioner is just like picking a life partner to me. Okay, it's not as important a decision, but it's still one of those decisions where uh, it's much better to put the work in up front, making sure they're right for you than trying to resolve it later once you realize that they're not. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. As I said, um, I, I very much doubt I'm going to title this as a complete guide because uh, this is to some degree off the top of my head. If you think I'm missing elements there, uh, both in terms of types of practitioners for this list at the end or in terms of um, you know the initial list I gave for practitioners in general, then maybe I am. Tell us about it, put it in the comments. I look forward to hearing from you. As Chrissy said, I don't think I've ever seen any content, educational content on this topic either. So uh, please do share it with anyone who you think would uh, benefit from it. Um, we always appreciate that. We don't do any advertising. We don't pay any money to you know try and spread this po uh, podcast. We're entirely dependent on you. Um, and uh, other than that, see you next time. Fantastic. Well said, Owen. And again, your engagement is key. It helps us. So please, again, always leave your comments, you know, your, you know, just any suggestions as well on future episodes and other questions you might have around this. Like Owen says, he is really good and very responsive, especially on YouTube for your, to respond to your, your questions. So please remember to hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss a, an episode and we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here, if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below, if you want to click on that one and watch that next.